You're watching Medfield TV Community Shows. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the open session portion of the Board of Selectmen for Monday, February 19th, 2019. Uh, this meeting, as always, is being video recorded. Uh, we'll begin uh, by taking a moment of appreciation for our troops serving in the Middle East and around the world. Thank you. Our first appointment tonight is a presentation from uh, Mayrock Development concerning their proposed Chapter 40B project under the Local Initiative Program uh, at the on Peter Christoph Way at the location of the current American Legion. Uh, we got a memo just to give a little background for folks watching at home and those who are here who have not attended the previous meetings on this. Uh, the board got a memo from Jim Brand on behalf of the Affordable Housing Trust, uh, which has endorsed this project. Uh, the Affordable Housing Trust had three public meetings in October, December, and February uh, to get a, a substantial amount of information. Uh, we asked for, I think, more information than we usually do or, or than we have in the past with this project, uh, in part because where this project fits in with the overall housing production plan. And so uh, with the endorsement from the trust, if this is, is approved tonight and goes forward, it would be targeted for a comprehensive permit application approval in May of 2020 and would buy us two years of safe harbor from 2020 to 2022. It would really be the last uh, substantial project we'd be looking to do um, under the housing production plan. Certainly nothing bigger and probably nothing close to it. So we wanted to be fairly confident that this would be li likely to succeed. It's likely to go forward and meet the targeted uh, date that we have. And so from a strategic perspective, that's where we're coming at this from the housing production uh, plan standpoint. So we've had uh, three pretty extensive meetings, a lot of information from, from these gentlemen, which we appreciate. Um, so I'll turn it over to you all to start. If you want to give us an introduction, introduce yourselves um, and introduce the project. I would suggest for viewers at home and future our future fans on YouTube, if you would speak either from the podium or if anyone wants to speak from someplace other than the podium, just have the microphone and speak into that so that people can pick it up. So, Mr. O'Brien, go right ahead. Good evening. I'm attorney Vin O'Brien. I represent the, uh, the development team, and I'd just like to introduce the development team. Bill Lane and Ed Coolbrith are the, uh, are the developers and the sponsors of this. Uh, we have um, Chris from CJ Design, who's our architect. Uh, Dan Merrickin's our engineer, and um, Dean Harrison's our 40B consultant, who will uh, bring us through the waters with DHCD if the time comes. Uh, as uh, Mr. Marcucci mentioned, we did have uh, three public meetings with the uh, Housing Trust. We also had a preliminary meeting with uh, some of the neighbors, and we've uh, worked with and tried to work with uh, the, um, the local uh, American Legion Post, uh, and that's part of the design. Um, I'm not sure uh, how much uh, the public knows about this project, and we're hoping that at least the selectmen got all the information we provided to the Housing Trust which included, amongst other things, a uh, traffic study showing a, a, a nominal reduction in traffic. <clears throat> in addition to that, um, we provided to them a fiscal impact study which showed a net fiscal benefit to the town. Also, a market study um, which uh, kind of talked about the project overall, its involvement in the town, its success potential in the town, and other related towns. Um, I will also say that the town, especially uh, Sarah Raposa, was very helpful in giving us a lot of uh, detailed information the town had from prior studies, which was very insightful and beneficial to us. Uh, overall, the project is um, a rental project, which provides uh, a greater safe harbor to the town, because all the rental units will be counted towards your 10%. However, 25% um, of those would be affordable. However, the overall price, we think, is in, in the affordable range for all these units. There's also the potential that 70% of the uh, affordable units can have some sort of local preference. Um, we try to integrate into the design um, a, a more pleasant kind of uh, pitch roof look as opposed to a flat roof. We incorporated, and Chris may touch on this, uh, all of our um, uh, HVAC elements in and, in and behind those roofs so they're not uh, protruding from the top of the building. 
part of our uh, arrangement with the post is that we're providing a 1500 foot uh, function room which is for the for the people in the unit themselves but also the legion gets a lot of use of that and it's guaranteed for for many many years and uh, we're hoping that will be the case for a long long time they'll also have some storage facilities for their for their various flags etc um, the the premises itself based upon feedback from the town um, and from another project my clients had done, we want it to be a very high quality construction. Um, we would like and hope and anticipate and want to have on-site management, which would make it beneficial not only to the people who live there, but also to anyone in town who has any questions or comments or needs to reach somebody, there'll be an on-site management team four or five days a week. Um, most of the units we try to create a, a, a broken up feel so there's each each or most of the units have uh, exterior decks so they're attractive open air um, um, an open air design and also which uh, we think is uh, unique is this unit will have an elevator so it'll make it easy for people to get up to the to the second third floor uh, overall um, we we hope we provided to you all the uh, background information that you need to review this uh, project. Um, however, to the extent you may have any questions, either from myself, the developers, the architect, or our 40B consultant, we'd be happy to answer any of those. Overall, we think it's a, a great project. It's a mixture of single, uh, uh, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom units. The final breakdown of that will probably work out with the ZBA in the final analysis. When we started the project, we had our uh, greater emphasis on one bedrooms, but based upon some of the information we've actually received from the town, probably gonna reduce some of those, to change those to two bedrooms. Uh, but as I say, as we go through the actual design process, we'll fine tune that. Um, I think that's, uh, that's our overall presentation. If there's any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Great. Um, so we'll start, Pete, questions. I guess uh, the first thing that jumps out at me is the four stories. I didn't realize it was four stories tall. Um, it, how does that mass compare to any other structure in town? I'm not familiar with any other housing structure. Um, I'm not sure the size of steeple on the townhouse or something like that. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I don't know if Chris, you have any comment on that. I don't know. Uh, Height-wise, what's the overall height of the building? Yeah. Sort of grab. You just need a microphone. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> or you can go up and kick Finn out. Stay next to you. Yeah. Around this way so I don't knock anything over. Um, my name is Chris Cherry. I'm with uh, CJC Design. And um, to answer your question, as far as this building goes, uh, to the very top of the ridge, right now we're measured at 52 feet. And we're looking at this as being um, three stories with a fourth built into basically the attic space, built into the pitched roof. Um, at the ends of the building to break down the massing, um, we lower it down to two stories with a third built into the attic space. And you can see that, you can see that here, this roof line plunges down and this portion is, ador is dormered off, um, similar to how we're treating the, the main part of the building up top here. Yeah, it seems like a good design to try to mass the size of it to a certain extent, but um, I mean, I don't think we have another four-story building in town, so. Um, what about the, um, you said that the town had a preference for, for more two bedroom units over one bedroom? Uh, the, the um, it was, I think it was a senior housing study or there was a housing study um, by Mr. Wolf, I believe was, do I have that correct? And he had made his presentation before our first meeting in October. And um, I think he thought the seniors alone would need about 179 units in the next few years. And of that, the, the vast majority uh, preferred uh, two bedroom versus one bedroom. Our other project in Weymouth, the vast majority, the wed one bedrooms, are there's a waiting list for them, basically. Um, so, so in Weymouth, the one bedrooms are more popular than More the popular two? in Weymouth. However, here, there seem to be uh, a, a good appetite for two bedrooms. So we will, we will take that into consideration. Based on that survey, you're saying? Yes, primarily based on that survey. And um, there was another point you had right before that. Um, I can't remember what it was. I'm so sorry. one of the sheets that, that I was reviewing over the weekend when I got all the material that interested me was that it looked like you were giving the town its choice with regard to three different configurations in terms of the, the uh, one, two, three bedroom. We had not called it a choice, but those were the options that we put out there. And I'm assuming once we get to the actual planning stage, we will hopefully get more input from the town. And those were, those are basically the three options. 
and uh, and so we you and, and you guys are good with any of those three? Is that yes. the way it's working out? DHCD yeah. is going to weigh in on the uh, three bedroom units. Right. Yeah. Well, you, you can't. You need to talk to a microphone. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. That allows the people at home to hear you. Yeah. It, it, the the Gables and University Ave and uh, Westwood. Um, if you look on their web page, you'll see that there's more vacancies on the two bedrooms and uh, that there is on the one beds, and there's significantly more one bedrooms in that complex than twos. Uh, because so there's more demand for the one bedroom. There's a lot more demand on room. that particular property for the one beds, and that's what we've found in other facilities. And we do have two beds, but we're also doing the three beds here. So what you typically, uh, when I look at, I'm looking at the twos and threes together and then looking at the ones. We have a higher ratio of twos and threes than they have over at the Gables in uh, Westwood. Yeah, and I, I would just, not to interject into Pete's question time here, but I think on the, the one, two, and three bedroom issue, I mean, I, I'm obviously familiar with the, the survey, senior housing survey. I mean, th that did also reflect relatively light demand for, for rentals. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is some demand for it. And so I don't know if, if in response to that survey, I would necessarily up the number of two bedrooms. I mean, it's yeah, up to you. It's a business decision. I would say that the, the evidence of a waiting list and a, not a similar property would probably suggest that the demand would be similar here. But that's, that's a business decision for you guys. I, I wouldn't necessarily take the results of that survey to express a preference in the, uh, from the town for more. It, it was insightful, and it yeah. adjusted things a little bit. And I did want to, one thing that I, yeah. um, you mentioned that the design, part of the design was to, in it, the three and a half story design, was to try to keep the building to some degree compact. Under, under 40B, um, the developers generally have a lot of latitude as far as uh, wetland setbacks, and they can build right up to the wetlands. What we have done, made every effort to do, is not only meet the state guidelines, but all the local setback requirements, and that is beneficial to the town and to the Conservation Commission, but it kind of affected our design to keep it tight. That, that was just one of the things we took into, into perspective, too. W would it be helpful, Pete, if they gave you, do you have a layout? Do you have a... Did you have, put up one of the layout um, demonstrations that you had just to show where the building will be on the on the Legion site. I think one of the beneficial things of this site is that there's that huge hill, the old uh, uh, landfill behind it, so that the, that'll kind of mask the, uh, yes. the height of it. Yeah. It's, it's almost sort of sitting in a little bell. So just, just to give you some perspective. I wait. Nope. This, this is the building, and uh, this is mostly parking here, and there's a vegetative barrier around the perimeter, which we'll retain. Now, we did mention with the, the housing trust, you know, this entrance, if, if it may be adjusted a little bit for traffic safety, that's something we take into consideration when we get the final design. But in essence, we want to keep this vegetative barrier. Part of the barrier has, has some wetlands, and the setbacks from the wetlands under state law, as I said, we can right to the edge of wetlands. We don't want to do that. We're, we're keeping completely, totally within the setbacks of, of the local uh, Medfield uh, setback requirements under the Conservation Commission. Could you explain what you just, when you just talked about the access to the site, is it still going out? The original right now it's going out the original way. One of the questions that came up during the uh, housing trust was, what impact will this site have on traffic? And although we showed that it have a, most likely a negative impact, there's still some question about that intersection at 27 as being a difficult or dangerous intersection. And during the process meeting with the housing trust, we said you know, during the design phase, if it is all beneficial and makes it better for that intersection for us to move the, the uh, entry and exit point a little further up from the intersection would be willing to do that provided we don't impact the wetlands but that will be at the design phase I, I would because i use that intersection a lot i yeah. can't imagine how moving it closer to no no, no not west closer mill, no west moving it close to west mill would improve okay. things because there's a lot of people that come out of west mill you, you kind of I, I, okay, again, that's just an opinion, but I was just trying to understand what you said. That, that's exactly the kind of things they actually think will come up during the actual design. Yeah. If I could just speak to that just quickly. I mean, obviously, the, the West Street intersection is sort of on the list for, it's our worst intersection in town. It's on the state bad intersection list. And so we just wanted to make sure that if there is a, when, if and when there is a redesign, hopefully a state-funded redesign of that intersection, if through their engineers, for example, 
if they decided that the way to do it was to put a light at which so you have a double light there mm. or something oh, like that, yeah. that they would be flexible yeah. enough okay. in moving it if yeah. just in response to the traffic engineering of the, of the intersection. Okay. That was not, I think they would like to leave it the way it is. Yeah, and just, we just wanted some flexibility if that gets revised to make sure that, that they'll be flexible in that. In that way. Uh, long story short, during the design phase, we're open to anything that makes the project better for the town and better for us. PTF. So I guess yeah. the last thing, I, I just uh, confirm what I think I heard from you, which is that because of the way this is structured legally, we can have 70% local preference for midfield? That's what I understand, yes. Uh, of the affordable units. Of the affordable so, units. Affordable yeah. units. So yeah. of the is it 18, 14, of the 14 affordable units, essentially 10 of them can have yeah, a midfield That's a preference. good result. So yeah. those were my questions. Thank you. Gus? You just keep on with that one, mm. but you actually think that all of the unit, although there would be only 14. certain 14 designated as affordable, you were actually anticipating that the price yeah, we, would be we something think, that would be in that, at least in the strike zone, of being affordable for all of them? I think they're very reasonable. I think the price is reasonable. In fact, um, uh, the consultant for the town, Courtney, whose last name I can't recall, was like, wow, those are we we'll, won't have a problem renting those, and that's our goal, because okay. it's a long-term project for us. This is not a for sale project. It's a, it's a long-term project. We want it to be successful. We want nominal vacancy. Okay. Uh, we want it to be a good project. So 70% of the 14 could be preferred, but not the other? They wouldn't be preferred, but I still think you have oh, a, a, lot, a yes. lot of people in town that can use it. Okay. And then this is one building with an elevator. Is there anything about the format that makes the, beyond the elevator, which makes it more senior friendly than a four-story building with stairs. Um, is there anything else about the format that would, would skew it toward being senior friendly? Uh, I just think the price point it would make it senior friendly. I think the fact that it's close to downtown would make it senior friendly. Um, it's close to 27. Um, I think the design, the interior design, will, uh, will be attractive to anyone. Mm -hmm. I would think that the the full time on site management would probably be a plus. You know, I, I almost, so. as I say to the the guys, it's almost like a concierge service, concierge service for the, for those folks. Is somebody there to help them you know, get an Uber or whatever they might need, or uh, any questions they may have? I think that's that's ancillary to to your question. Yes. So let me push just a little bit harder. Sure. Is there any possibility that you would make any of the units? Um, I guess, I guess I'm almost going all the way to handicapped accessible because I'm not trying to necessarily make them senior, but I, I, I think there's a requirement for that anyways under 40B, so. Yeah, just do you want to get, so, if somebody with a microphone can answer yeah. that question, that would be good. <laughs> uh, Dean Harrison, um, under the state building code, you have to have at least 5% uh, handicapped fully handicapped accessible. Uh, anything on in the floor would be handicapped adaptable. Um, so the doors would be three foot wide and the handles would all be that. But you have to have at least a minimum of 5%. Okay. Where, so, where, where I'm coming from, because I was involved with the senior housing survey, is there is, a, there is some demand for apartments and to the extent that there's anything that can be done to make. There's a slight difference between just a, an apartment, you have an elevator, but you have stairs going in, mm -hmm. or whatever, and versus a little bit of thought around at least some of these units might be easier for seniors. And I'm not trying to turn it into a senior no. complex, but just no, I mean, one from thing a we, market standpoint, that might be. Right, from a marketing better. standpoint, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one thing we could look at in the design phase is talk about um, instead of bathtub, shower stalls. Well, I'm from the ones come along, some two bedrooms yeah. seem to be very useful for the elders as they get older. I hate to say it, I'm starting to think about those things myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, might, I might add that the, this facility has a much larger function room than you would normally f find in a property of this size. Uh, prime, we, that was designed that way because of our commitment to the uh, Legion members. But other properties at 50 units, they don't have any uh, area for a uh, community room. Our other property doesn't have a, a, a space. Mm -hmm. So the, this, the size of community center that we have would be typically seen in a couple hundred units. Okay. Speaking personally, the fact that you're doing that for the Legion, coming into this meeting, you were several notches farther up the scale just because you're willing to do that. So, um, I think. Right. Um, 
these folks have got enough of my questions over the last, so I don't have anything further. They're, they're, they've had it, I'm sure. Um, I did want to say, though, you know, throughout the process, I, I've really appreciated all the work they've done and the effort they put forward. And obviously, we meet a lot of people in this um, doing this sort of thing, and they've they've been um, completely honest and straightforward and professional the whole way through. And so, uh, I do appreciate that and appreciate all the information that you provided us, um, even down to the, to the financial study. I mean, the, the financial study which shows a net positive benefit to the town. I, I think it will be more positive than what the study shows. They're very conservatively estimating the costs and the incremental costs, and I'd be surprised if the actual inter- incremental costs are even close to what's estimated. So I appreciate that as well, because you do get a lot of number fudging in this process, and there really hasn't been at all, and so I appreciate that. Before we kind of conclude here, I wanted to see if Mr. Connor or Mr. Manganello wanted to, to say anything about this from the Legion's perspective. Yeah. Mr. Connor? <laughs> uh, my name's David Connor, and I'm the commander of uh, Post 110 here in Medfield. Um, go back a little bit. The Legion was founded in 1919. Medfield Post 110 was founded in 1919. So we've been, they've been here 100 years working hand in hand with the village and the town going forward. It's a, this particular project is a win-win for everybody. Not only what we perform and what we do, and, and Al will get deeper into that. However, I think that we work extremely hard and this is what we really need and I hope that you find that you agree with me thank you thank you now mr. Manganello thank you uh, most of you know me my name is Al Manganello I've been the uh, Legion manager for the past 43 years I'm a lifelong Medfield resident, graduate of class of 64 in Medfield High, and a Vietnam veteran. I joined the Legion back in 1966, and uh, I've worked with numerous committees with the Legion, the Executive Board, Board of Trustees. I've been a past commander five times. Within the town of Medfield, I'm on the Memorial Day Committee, Veterans Day Committee, and I'm on the Cemetery Commission. I'm, I try to uh, help out the town as much as I can. Uh, like the commander said, the Legion's been around town since, uh, for 100 years, and we've always been happily involved. We are not only a home for Medfield veterans and their families, but we've been strong supporters for so many ongoings in town. A quick list of some examples the Legion does and supports time and money to. We're involved with Medfield High School scholarships, Boys and Girls State for Medfield High School students. Medfield Senior Citizens Christmas Parties, Children's Christmas Party, Uh, Medfield Day, we work with Memo, sponsor Medfield Little League, Legion Baseball, Medfield Boys and Girl Scouts, we're involved in the Memorial Day Parade, Veterans Day Services, Massachusetts State Trooper Programs, School Function Sponsorships, Uh, the Medfield uh, Fishing Derby, very active in VA hospital visits, care packages to soldiers and their families. We also help and donate to the Midfield Police, Midfield Fire, Midfield Food Pantries, Friends of Seniors, in the Needs Dog Program. We take care of all the flags and replace them, whether around town or in the cemetery yearly. We also are the home to the Midfield Lions Club. Uh, For decades, the Midfield Legion was the place to go for weddings, birthday parties, christening showers, and all celebrations. We've had functions every weekend and some weeknights. Our bar was always full of Midfield locals, as as well as the people who worked around town. It was the hot spot back then. As times have changed, so has our business. Our building is outdated, and with no money to update the repair, it lacks the funds for the current design people are looking for for their functions. 
We're white, more white collar families in town. We see little to no business during the day at the lounge. Our membership has gone from almost 500 members down to about 20 at active meetings. People are just getting older and deceased. Our youngest active member is 65 years old. What we have found in the past 15 or so years is that the midfield men and women who enter the military cannot afford to move back into town. Which brings us here tonight. As of today, our financial status is calling upon bankruptcy. Our bills are backed up and we will be heading to collection soon. It costs thousands of dollars a month to operate and for our insurance, we are not seeing any business. On top of little business, our building is at tear down status. Our roof is leaking, our septic is backing up, heating and cooling systems need to be replaced. The parking lot's a mess, the electrical needs to be updated, and endless other things, cosmetic. Uh, our only chance in keeping Medfield Legion alive, we've talked to many developers, and we are here tonight with Mayrock. We have chosen Mayrock. Not only will we be financially stable for decades to come, but they have given us, the Medfield veterans, a place to still call home a place where we can hang our hats, our flags, our memories. They've given us a place where veterans can continue to have our meetings and a place for us to get together. It's a place for us to be remembered. It will also bring the sons of the Legion and the ladies of the Azili, uh, so they can, a place where they can call home, as well as the Lions. Most importantly, we will be able to continue to support all of the organizations I have uh, mentioned. Uh, we have spent many, a couple of years now looking for this, and we hope to continue marching on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go ahead. I, I, uh, I, in response to that, I'd like to address the members of the Legion uh, about one thing. You, you went through a pretty long list of all the things that the Legion does for the town. Uh, and I want to comment on just one that stuck with me for several years now because two of my sons have taken advantage of it, and it's Boy State. They don't have any girls, so I can't speak to girls State, but uh, <laughs> Boy State. Uh, I've been aware for some years, I don't know the exact financial status you had, but I knew that you've been struggling financially for years, or uh, for some years. And the, to my knowledge, I don't know if this is your policy or not, but to my knowledge, I don't believe you've ever turned down an applicant from from Medfield who wanted to either go to Boys State or Girls State. Yeah. And that's for those who aren't aware of it, because I wasn't that aware until my sons went. It's not cheap to send people to Boys State. So the fact there are a lot of things that I admire about the members of the Legion. But this one particular thing, the fact that as much as you were struggling financially to keep it all together, you never wavered from that commitment to send our young, our young girls and boys to boys' state and girls' state. Uh, that's one of the things that makes Medfield what it is as a town. And I just have a great deep admiration for the fact that that was important enough to you that regardless of whether you had a nice, neat, tied up financial answer for how you're gonna keep this all going. Uh, that, that's not the only thing you do. I'm also Troop 89, you're the chartering organization, but that one thing over the past several years has hit uh, very deeply with me. And I just admire all of you for your commitment to doing that. Thank you. Well, thank you. Just for a second. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, my name is Jim McKenzie. I represent the Legion, and I have represented them throughout the process of this of this transaction. And I think there was some information that they didn't didn't give you that you should know about. This has been a difficult process because, as Al mentioned, the building is in in dire straits. The membership is dying off. Their finances were 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 very dire. This, among all the people that we courted or solicited bids from, this was the only organization that was willing to work with the Legion to allow them to maintain solvency while the whole process is working out. 
they are able to use, will be able to continue to use the building rent free uh, until such time as it is torn down by Mayrock and the construction begins, which will be in a couple of years. They've agreed to provide a financial, they've already provided a, a, an upfront payment for the purchase price of the building, and we're able to get a stipend every month to keep the, the, the Medfield Legion finances in the black. They will provide, as, as was indicated previously, uh, a space for the exclusive use of the Legion at no cost in perpetuity. It's not for a fixed period of time, it's in perpetuity, as long as the Legion is able to use it. They will have an exclusive space to store their memorabilia and their flags and so on like that at no cost to them. So this is really a win-win. It's a win for the town in terms of the project that's being offered. It's a win for the Legion because it will keep them alive. Because without this, quite frankly, I think they would have been out of business right now. But the monthly stipend is keeping them in business now. It's allowing them to continue to provide the services they do and to keep their organization and their meetings going until the new building is built when they will have that use of that, of that facility at no cost or obligation to them in, in perpetuity. Thank you very much. Do we have any other questions or, or comments from the public? If, here, oh, Pete? I just uh, wanted to say a couple things. One is one of the things that I, I recognized after m moving to Medfield and getting involved was what a big part of Medfield the Legion was, and that was a big, it was a nice discovery for me to discover how many things went on at the Legion, and uh, and you guys should know that the uh, Memorial Day Parade ends at your property. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so I just wanted to, say how much uh, appreciation I have for what the Legion has meant to the town. And so, and it's nice to hear you enumerate everything, Al, that the Legion is involved with. And I also just wanted to uh, uh, share that these people reached out to me early on in the process and asked to meet with me and with the, uh, the Legion members. And, and I know that they met with Mike because he came in right after me. Um, and, and that was appreciated too. Um, so thank you guys for doing that. Well, thank you all. Without without that, we're ready to vote. Do you have a motion? Approving? This is I think would be yeah, it would be subject to agreeing to a memorandum of understanding that's already been it's already in the works between Sarah and um, representatives of Mayrock to to sort out our, our standard MOU contract governing kind of what we're going to do, what they're going to do, kind of in the process. And I don't think there's been any snags or major issues in that front. Uh, no, and I apologize that. It did not make your packets, um, so that is why you do not have a copy of it. I think I think we've done it. I think we've done the pr approval and then done. It's, it's basically ministerial at that point because I don't think the, other than the timing, we don't have a lot of um, bells and whistles to this particular one. I don't. I don't think so. So I think we can vote our endorsement of this as a lip and then sign the MOU at a future meeting. Uh, approval or endorsement, or does it matter? Approval. I would say approval as a lip to move forward, subject to working out an MOU to be approved at a later date. I figure day. after nine months we'd have this all done. <laughs> um, okay, I, I uh, move that the uh, we vote to approve the uh, proposed project uh, by from Mayrock, subject to the successful conclusion of the Memorandum of Understanding. Second. As a local initiative project. As a lo Yes, approval as a local initiative project. Second. All in favor? Aye. Yep. Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Good luck, Al. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now, put a tweet out about it. Yeah. Oh, is it? <laughs> Let them know. Oh, wow. <laughs>
lot more. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, absolutely, David. Oh, right, right. Yeah, right. Yes. Yes. Yeah, the, the solar house. I didn't know anything about it. Do I know you from Are you in Franklin for a while? I am in Franklin as well. I'm the Franklin Town Attorney as well. How long have you been doing that? Uh, 17 years. I was going to say, I used to be with Gabe. Okay, well, that's when I first arrived. Yeah. Yeah. jokes. Yeah. I came in at the tail of the day. Sorry, I recognize this point. I know, and then I saw the email. I hate to disappoint the tens of people who watch this. I've had three three concerned citizens already concerned. So, All right, so our, uh, our next appointment. Um, is with uh, Darcy Schofield from the MAPC to present our natural hazard mitigation plan. Welcome, Ms. Schofield. Um, good evening. Thank you all for having me here tonight. It's I go to a lot of meetings of the Board of Selectmen and never have I ever been a little choked up. <laughs> That was really touching and heartwarming. So it's a tough. It's a tough to act to follow. It is a tough act to follow. It's got to be one heck of a plan. We talk about doom and gloom. You're going to be calling the veterans back, right? No pressure. Um, so I, I will uh, try to be brief. So thank you again for having me today. I'm a senior environmental planner with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Working, we are working with the town of Medfield on their updating their natural hazard mitigation plan. I'm here to present this to you as part of our public meeting process in this, um, during this planning process. Um, this will be first, the first of two. Uh, so wanted to tell you a little bit about what we're doing, how we're doing it, how this aligns with other efforts we're doing with the, with the town of Medfield. Um, the Federal Disaster Mitigation Act requires towns to adopt and update hazard mitigation plans to be eligible for FEMA funding. Your first plan was in 2011 and now we're time to be updated. Um, this will, once it's updated and it's approved by FEMA, it'll allow the town to, to qualify for federal grants to, that can help um, reduce natural hazards um, that are, can be sizable and do major infrastructure upgrades for your community. <clears throat> this plan is de being done in, con in combination with the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm like this lingering cold. <clears throat> Through the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So um, with the Governor Baker's executive order um, on climate change, he enabled a program called Municipal Vulnerability, or MVP, which provides funding for city and towns to work together through a community resilience building process to identify challenges and strengths in the communities related to natural hazards and climate change. So um, this effort with the Natural Hazard Mitigation Plan and MVP is um, happening on a parallel path and they'll be integrated and aligned. And this is similar to what the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has itself just completed their own hazard mitigation plan and climate adaptation plan and an integrated. So we're, we're at sort of emulating that process. Um, so because you have an excellent planner here, uh, she has uh, secured funding for, from the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs for the MVP program, which is also supporting the hazard mitigation plan in addition to a hazard mitigation grant. So this is all a grant funded program. So what is natural hazard? So we're looking at planning for uh, flooding, brush fires, earthquakes, landslides, extreme temperatures, both extreme heat and extreme cold, drought, ice jams, tsunamis is part of that, but I think we're safe here. High winds, hurricanes, tornadoes, tornadoes, winter storms, snow, and ice. It is important to understand this isn't an emergency response plan, so we're not actually thinking about the mechanisms in which we're saving people in the event of a natural hazard or natural disaster, but we are looking to minimize some of those impacts in the event those, those were to occur. Um, so hazard mitigation is to permanently reduce or prevent losses of life, injuries, and property damage by using long-term strategy. So in a natural hazard mitigation plan, we're looking at what's happened historically. With MVP, we're going to align one of those actions in, the, in what's happened historically and how, what the town has taken up to date and looks to do ahead with what climate scientists are projecting into the future. So we may have today eight 
eight days over 90 degrees, which is pretty typical. If we're looking towards mid-century, that will increase to over 30, and towards the end of the century, it's between 50 and 70 days over 90 degrees. So we want to be able to align both what's happened historically and what we're looking at in the future. We want to find what actions are being taken now to reduce future risks and damage, and what additional actions can we take in the future. So we're really just breaking the cycle of disaster. So we have a natural hazard, we have a severe storm, trees come down, um, we need to rebuild two winters more. Again, we have another nor'easter, trees come down on houses, we need to rebuild. So we're trying to minimize that cycle. So some of our techniques for hazard mitigation and climate action, there's a lot of overlap there, is looking at prevention, property protection. So what are some resilient strategies to minimize damage in a natural hazard? Public education and awareness, so for example, um, the work being done on, on, on tick-borne diseases can help eliminate future health risks with climate change. Natural resource protection, so healthy wetland ecosystems are going to continue to serve. Uh, that function of holding water when we have excessive rain. Structural projects, many of our communities like to um, um, upgrade their stormwater infrastructure, which is reaching the end of its life. Um, and emergency services protection. So do we have systems in place to help enable that emergency man um, comprehensive, comprehensive emergency management plan? So um, how do we do this? So we provide, MAPC is providing the technical assistance for the plan development under an, what's called a hazard mitigation grant program grant, um, which is through FEMA. Uh, we coordinate the plan update through the local hazard mitigation team, which Sarah has put together. And this is comprised of um, planning department, conservation, public works, emergency response, um, and some others. So we have a real, some volunteers in town, so we have a really diverse group that are, are very engaged in this process. We actually have a lot of fun in our meetings. Um, we also reach out to stakeholders, so we're going to reach out to residents, businesses, institutions, and community organizations through this process so we can get their input. We'll have two public meetings, this is the first during the plan uh, development, and then once it's complete, the public will have an opportunity to review and provide comments. So where are we at in this process? This is the entire process that MEPC goes through to complete the Natural Hazard Mitigation Plan update. So we do um, updating the hazard mitigation and mapping. We've completed that. Uh, step two, looking at critical facilities. We've done that. Number three, update assessment of risk and vulnerability. We've done that. Um, and we're just about to start uh, number four, which is looking at what are some of your existing mitigation measures, are they working? Do we need to uh, eliminate those or prior reprioritize those? And then what are some new mitigation strategies to minimize natural hazards? Um, at that point, we'll send the plan to MEMA for their approval. Then it goes to FEMA for their approval. And once it's approved, we will bring it back to the Board of Selectmen for you to adopt. Once it's adopted, it is we will, we will uh, look to, towards implementation and updating again in seven years. So for hazard mapping, we use state and federal data on floodplains, snow, fall, wind speeds, hurricane, earthquake risk, et cetera. Again, typically in this plan, we're looking to the past, but aligning it with MVP, we're looking at state data for the future and other federal data. We integrate the Massachusetts State Hazard Mitigation and Climate Adaptation Plan, which just came out this past September. And we coordinate with a local team to get their expertise on what they know um, about Medfield on the ground. So um, for example, these are some of what we call our locally identified hazard areas. So these are areas that our local, our hazard, our team, steering committee has identified as being prone to flooding or brush fires. Um, there aren't that many, some, some municipalities have a lot more. And I know this map is very difficult to see, but we also look at your critical facilities. Um, we map those locally identified hazards. We look at flood zones for FEMA, and we try to we do a geospatial analysis to try and understand the risk and hazard associated with those critical facilities. Um, so this is your list of critical facilities. We have about 52, I think. Um, they're not all uh, in order, I don't believe, but. Um, so critical facilities are infrastructure that's really required to allow your town to function on a day-to-day -day basis. So there are wells, emergency municipal services like emergency response buildings, schools, um, places that might be more vulnerable to natural hazards or climate change like um, affordable housing places or senior housing, things of that nature, churches, 
community gathering places, shelters. Um, so we have done a vulnerability analysis and what we're, we use a software system called Hazus to try and identify what would be the potential damage for certain types of um, natural hazards. This here we evaluate a hurricane at a 1% chance storm, which is more commonly known as the 100-year storm, and the 0.2% chance storm, which is commonly known as the 500-year storm. So we're looking at 346 million and 5 billion, and this is your sort of the total estimated damages associated with buildings, and that's residences, commercials, and industrial, as well as business interruption. So these numbers are based on 20 cen 2010 census data, assessor data, so they're rough estimates, but it can give you a sense of the, the challenges I had that, um, <clears throat> that you want to be thinking about in terms of how that would interrupt your, your community. So flooding, where an earthquake magnitude of five or seven is extraordinarily unlikely to happen. There was a very um, low risk, but the damage would be high if it, if it did occur. And there, it could happen, it just doesn't happen very frequently. Um, a 1% annual chance flood is probably more likely what we're to see um, in the past or in the future, particularly with the Charles River. Uh, so that could be in the range of six to seven million. Again, so this is residences, business, commercial business, industrial, as well as business interruption. So we'll take a look now, or as I mentioned, we're just about to um, get together again to look at what are some of those mitigation uh, measures. So what are the gaps? What actions can we take to further reduce vulnerability? What are your priorities? And how do we align that with MVP climate resilience? We do like to identify all the strengths in the town, and you have many. I won't go through all of these today, but we, we do look at every single potential natural hazard and ensure that there is a mitigation strategy associated with them. And then this is a graph uh, table that's taken from your 2011 natural hazard mitigation plan, which gives you a bit of a sense of ki the kinds of things we're looking at. We identify the hazard, we prioritize how important it is, who is going to be the lead implementer? Is this a short-term strategy or long-term strategy? An estimated cost, and where can we get the funding associated with it? Um, we ha I did want to just take a moment to mention that we did do our community resilience building workshop for the MVP on January 31st. It was very successful, very engaged community, and this is um, lots of scribbling. These are sort of this is my fun job to transcribe this um, into what will become your summary of findings and align these are actions related to minimizing damage and risks associated with climate change. So we'll align those actions in both the hazard mitigation and MVP. <clears throat> Here's a timeline of where we're at. Um, we'll be, need to schedule our third core team meeting. Um, I'll be writing between March and May. I will have a, and once I've completed my draft, I'll do a second public meeting with the Board of Selectmen. Um, June through September, we anticipate review by MEMA and FEMA, um, and then FEMA issues its notice of approval um, in September. This is a rough estimate. We could go faster if, if um, life it moves smoothly. And then we would be looking for the board to adopt it in the fall of 2019. So I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Pete. Um, I guess the, the, the one thing that jumped out at me was uh, the uh, when I saw two billion on the and that's damages in Medfield from a 500 year storm is that what I'm hearing yes from a hurricane so that includes wind speed it, so it includes precipitation flooding and wind speed so that that's why the damage again these are rough estimates it's the model isn't perfect it's just a way to grab a picture of it yeah well that's pretty much everything. That's, yeah, that sounds like our, flattening our total, the town. I mean, our, our total assessed value of all the property in town is about $2 billion. So but that includes, just put the whole town. <laughs> that includes business interruption. Right. So right. it also includes transportation utility damages. So I mean, I'm not disputing the number. Right. I'm just pointing out that that is the whole town. It's pretty destructive yeah. then, yeah. All right. We should dodge one of those if we could. <laughs> That's my job. I'm yeah. going to help you make sure that yeah. doesn't happen. <laughs> And it, uh, I guess the the only other thing I wanted to point out was the uh, when the when they when you showed the notes, 
the uh, I was at the blue table on the right there, and, and yes, look it up. I, I recognize your handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not my handwriting, but I, we, did, we we filled it up, and that was because Bobby Kennedy was at my table. <laughs> yes, the blue table did win the award for filling up every line. I'm going to be letting you know how long that took me to transcribe that. I well, and that's because Bobby Kennedy knows every inch of the town. So and it, was it was a really a, exciting day. It's a, it's always such a pleasure to listen to people talk about their town. Everyone knows so much, and they really bring a lot to the table. Anything else, Pete? No, that's it. Thank you. I have a few questions. Sure. Um, what do you think our top hazards are? I think for riverine communities that um, Flooding is probably going to be your top hazard, and that and and you have a tremendous amount of natural assets to bring to the table to protect, and you haven't you've had n nominal damage um, to your town. Looking at you know flood insurance claims, this is pretty nominal, so you're in good shape. I think the challenge that we're seeing, um, like for example, this past fall was the wettest year on record since precipitation has been recorded in 1890, 1891, and so when we see a raised water table like we still have today, um, and then we have excessive precipitation, excessive ice, excessive snow. The combination of those two is probably what's going to create more damage. The great, I mean, nor'easters, climate change in the future, they, there's no certainty on the frequency or the severity of future storms, but there is consensus that there will be more frequent and more severe storms. And I think in more um, tree covered communities like yours, Damage by trees is going to be pretty significant, and and that's a pretty real danger. <clears throat> Makes sense, um, <clears throat> Sarah. This may be a question for you. If you go to slide, I guess it would be twelve. It's the one that has the critical infrastructure. Yeah. I just believe, believe and I went through the list to see what was critical, and there were three things. Actually, two things that jumped out at me. The idea that vet clinics are critical. I found that interesting. I'm not quite sure I understand that totally, but that's okay. But the Heritage Hill Vet Clinic, isn't that the one on Farm Street? Cousin Dad's it's not there anymore. Yeah, that's not there anymore. So this, not there. this could be the um, 2011. Is this 2011? So this isn't an updated list? No, we worked on the updated list um, okay. at our last meeting. Or, yeah, it was our last meeting. Okay, so this is just to show us what a list looks like. This isn't the actual well, list. Well, this, is, oh, this? this is the list. So it, I don't believe we made too many changes. What the changes we made were um, were around addresses, but I don't think we eliminated any critical facilities. You've got too many vet clinics on the list. Then. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, but we can, I mean, you'll have the opportunity to comment on yeah. that, so okay. we can adjust that. There, okay. Yeah, we haven't seen anything um, final. Draft no, no, no. Draft right. Yet, yeah. so. No. It, and then by definition. Do our well fields all show up as critical infrastructure? Is why they're they do, yeah. they do, and and that's we recommend that for communities because um, for a number of reasons, damage associated with flooding is pretty severe. If yeah. you were to, you know, so the, so the reason I asked that question, and I'm glad Bill is here, we have two of the items are tub the tubular well fields, which right now a we're not using, and b it seems like it's even questionable whether we'll be able to draw water from them now. Okay. So, so the, okay, bottom line is there's maybe a couple things. To the extent that critical infrastructure drives projected costs of anything, then it seems to me really important to make sure we don't have needless things on the critical infrastructure list. Sure. If it's just a generic list to get us to think about stuff, then it's great. Um, I had one more. Oh. Uh, we can, let's make note of that, yeah. yeah. Informational purposes. There are a lot of... Um, animal organizations that are um, that exist because uh, pets are uh, members of people's families and if you're in a critical situation I can use um, the Cape for example where I am um, I was a planner in East Ham and we actually had an organization that worked with the emergency organizations mm -hmm. because the um, fear was that people weren't going to abandon or leave their pets unless they had a place to go so that's a part of the reason why yeah the, uh, that's the clinics are on there I, I found it interesting it made less but I understand that that's that's fine um, and then on slide 16 the I, and again this is only a partial list so the, it's the very last item there which is the state hospital property it didn't uh, now it's mostly all TBD 
uh, as far as the, the actual, I'm, I'm looking at this partially from, okay, this is hazard mitigation. At some point, you're deciding what risks, with what probability and magnitude do you choose to put resources again, you know, funding or take action on. So uh, my whole mindset sure. here is, all right, which things are actionable and which things are, a theor you know, mm -hmm. intellectually interesting but of no consequence. That one there, although it says it's high, Hey, I wasn't sure I really understood what the threat was given that the hospital property is mostly on a hill. Uh, Am I looking at the right side? The very last one. Well, yeah, and, it, and it's, okay. a lot of the stuff is to be determined, so I understand that's kind of so a... So this was from 2011. We haven't okay. updated these update. yet. Okay. So obviously we will, so we haven't got to this process yet. Yeah. So when we okay. do get to that process, there's a lot of things we'll X out. And this okay. is more than likely going okay. to be one of them because you've made a lot of advances on that okay. property. Those are my questions. Okay. Do we have any uh, questions or comments from the public? Mr. Massaro, public member number one. Just, just one comment. I saw the Medfield danger of flooding on the east side of Medfield Hospital, and I'm trying to, wondering where that was. Um, yeah. I mean, you don't really have to answer both, now. We can I talk. Live east of the I can be so both one of them <laughs> yes, about. very specific about this. We did talk about this in our last um, update, and we weren't exactly sure, to be honest with you. Um, they, we do think that there is a um, a stream that goes along the east side, there, which there is, but it, not, the problem is it's on the state. Stay but on. you recall that was a 2011 that subdivision didn't happen until yeah. after that so these are the types of things that we're working on through this process so if, if you yeah. want to run anything that you decide to put on the list about the hospital we'll make sure you're happy, here happy to at the next meeting and we'll put the draft plan on the web and invite comments from everybody Colleen no. oh no okay just told <laughs> Christine no, I just wanted to say it was a great meeting at, at the high school. I didn't get to stay all day, but I was there for the, for the morning session. And it was just nice to see that many people on a work day who were interested in giving up their entire day to be there. So it was uh, a very good participation, I thought. Okay. Mark, any questions or comments? Or? Well, thank you very much. Okay, Appreciate thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Medfield Historical Commission. Discussion of war. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no. I apologize. Nope. Um, Andrea Costello, <laughs> I apologize to, to discuss the. Well, I was looking at the time, but like, I can't believe we're ahead of time. We're not. We're behind. So I thought that's what I thought. So, Ms. Costello, how are you? I'm sorry, good, Dan. Thank you. <laughs> My name's Andy Costello. I'm at 84 Bridge Street, and I'm working with the Medfield Plastic Production Initiative to bring a, an article to town meeting to ban plastic bags at checkout. And I'm here to give you a, an update. Thank you. In your packet, you have a uh, sort of an agenda of things that we are working on. And I have an update for you more on that one. And you have a flyer that we've given to, one second, we have given to 63 businesses in town. We canvassed the entire town. And that includes businesses that don't all use plastic bags. And I know there's more businesses than that in town, but we um, went to the storefront places and um, we were received very, very warmly. Uh, we found out that about 22 of those businesses use plastic bags or a combination of plastic and paper. And they all know that this is something that they will probably eventually have to do anyway. So there were no, cons there were no um, complaints one concern about being badly rated on Yelp because they didn't give a plastic bag, um, but they were still very much in favor of this. And um, the uh, some of the, one of the larger chains in town has knows it's coming. They just won't really talk to us, but we know that they know that it's coming because they're in about 50 towns in the state that have this bylaw. There are now 93 towns in the state that have some sort of plastic bag ban or ordinance, uh, bylaw or ordinance. We, uh, to get you up to speed on what we've done since I sent this to um, Evelyn last week, the bylaw um, 
is done, and we've talked to Christine about, there's one th part that we had a question on, which was the fact that there are three or four different groups in town that are groups that you would go to if you had a complaint, and we were wondering if maybe there should just be one point person. And uh, Christine suggested that we leave it as is, but that we talk to the Board of Health and asked if they, and ask if they would be the point person if anybody had a complaint. Most of the towns in the state will tell you that a citizen will go into a store and just ask why they're still using plastic and sort of shame, shame them into saying, oh, you're right, we should be using paper, and there's never, it's never an issue. So um, we just wanted to make sure that the, that the bylaw was, was uh, strong enough so that nobody would be passing the buck in terms of enforcement. There's really nothing to do. We just want to ask the Board of Health. We will go to the Board of Health and ask them if they will be that point person. Um, we, uh, under the town organizations, we've been invited to speak at the Lions uh, on March 6th, and we will also be going to Memo on April 8th, and we've offered to um, speak to any organizations that would like us to come and talk to them about this. We have a website, it's awesome, and uh, we will be listing any uh, businesses that would like to sort of get on board with this and sponsor this, and what's one of the questions we asked when we canvassed the town, and they were very eager to put their name up there to uh, promote this, that was really nice to see. I think we have about 20 businesses that will be listed there. Um, and I just wanted to ask if you have any questions, and then I have a question for you. Pete? First of all, I, uh, first off, I want to just compliment you. Uh, the last time I saw you, you were dressed as the uh, bag lady on Medfield Day, <laughs> and it was a great costume. Um, I guess, secondly, my, my only question is really how your bylaw compares to the other uh, 93 that have already been passed. Is it pretty much the same? It's a conglomeration of a lot of them. This started in 2015, and those early bylaws are very, very um, sort of loosey-goosey, mostly because the industry, once, that, once they started to come around, the industry started to thicken up the bags. And so now a lot of the towns that did an ordinate a bylaw back in 1516 are now going back to strengthen their bylaws to include thicker plastic. For example, at Shaw's now you'll see at checkout there's a 10 cent bag you can buy that says it's recyclable. Um, it's, Market Basket is doing it, it's all over the country. Um, and the problem is that people are not recycling them, they're just throwing them away, so it's almost making the problem worse. Uh, so mm -hmm. now most of the 2017, 18, and 19 bylaws are all just saying no plastic. The, thick, the, the thickness, they used to say, you know, four mils or two and a half mils, and the early ones were two and a half mils, and they went up to four mils, and it's really hard to measure. So um, this is very much in keeping with um, the bylaws that are coming in in the late 18, 19, 2019. Okay. Um, and, and I guess as I understand what you were telling us is that you had no businesses, no retail establishments that were against the, the change. None. None. And there was one chain that just didn't wouldn't talk to you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, we know that there. We know that there. We we talked. We spent a lot of time talking. There's a there's a group out in Lee and Lennox who really promote. They they did this in their town and they promoted working on consensus. There are some towns that are just going with an ordinance and not telling anybody. They're just doing it and then everybody wakes up the next day and there's no plastic bags in the stores. And um, this group in Lee and Lennox has really promoted consensus and we went with that model. So we spent a lot of time with forums and showing movies and we're going to be showing movies again and there's a lot of trying to get the word out to people, um, both merchants and local residents, to just educate them and then if people decide not to vote for this in April that's fine but we believe we've really educated the town. Yep. This is coming. This is a real issue. This is one of many, many, it, one of the m many things that the merchants said was, how can I get rid of my big, large plastic garbage bags? And then the kids are saying, why can't we restrict um, single-use uh, stuff in the cafeteria? It's all styrofoam. Why and the kids are like, why are we just talking about bags? So that was kind of nice to hear. So there's, it's a start. But it's definitely coming. If you go online and look at anything having to do with recycling, or um, garbage these days, it's, it's the least we can do, yep. in a way. Okay, um, and I guess, um, I, I just will compliment you on, on your collaborative, the, the effort that you, you've made put into it, it's, it's been obviously a lot of work, and uh, 
there, there was a committee that was uh, looking at this before that, that uh, kind of petered out and didn't do the work, and so that it's nice to see the, it getting done, and, uh, and, and you're reaching out to everybody and, and bringing them in. So that thank you for doing it that way. And that's it, Mr. Chairman. So I'd echo Pete's uh, compliment about that, that collaborative consensus model. Yeah, okay. uh, I, I think the first time came, that was my biggest concern, is that we not jam it down people's throats, for one thing, because I just think it's wrong. But secondly, you wind up with people who are not predisposed to be cooperative. So you, when you're watching them, maybe they'll do what they're supposed to. But when you're not, they won't. And I, th I think it's the right way to go. Um, I had one question, though, and it only came up in this last week when Colleen wrote a, a patch article on Denise Garlick's hmm. legislation. The only question I have is if the state is moving ahead with a plastic bag ban, and I'm guessing that means it's in a one to two year time frame that that would, and I'm assuming, making an assumption that that will pass the state level, is it important, all that important for us to actually take action through a bylaw? Uh, and I'm only raising this because I'm, I'm bound and determined to eliminate enough articles from one of our annual town meetings to convince Scott McDermott to buy me a beer at the end. So this is <laughs> what I'm trying to do is make the town meeting simpler here. Um, but is there is it, it does it make sense for us to push forward with our bylaw, recognizing that there's pending legislation to make a state level that will obviously be uniform across the state and that perhaps won't be like ours? So there's, there's two ways the state could go. The state could do it as a uh, a minimum, saying this is a minimum requirement across, and communities can have a tighter bylaw if they want to. Or the state can what's called preempt the, the issue, basically say this will be the standard. There will be no <clears throat> no tightening in municipalities. This is from a business standpoint universal across the Commonwealth. I don't know which way the legislation has been drafted or how it's proceeding. Do you know what the state legislation is? Um, as the last time they tried it was to preempt. Um, so I don't know about this one. Um, the, the philosophy is across the state that it will take a couple of years to get it started. We, like, for example, ours, if we voted in in April, it will be a six-month waiting period. And if they mm -hmm. vote theirs in in the spring or fall, it will be six months more. Uh, Medfield uses four million plastic bags a year. so. If we save four million plastic bags for one year, it is definitely, and the education that is happening um, is worth it, and it may not pass. So, so what's we, behind my question is more got more to do with getting people trained to do one thing, and then the confusion that comes with training them to do something else. So I, I guess maybe I, I'm, I'm on board with what you're trying to yeah, do, so I'm not it, fighting the state, that. The state I would, may not I guess pass. the only thought I'd have then is if we if we know what Denise Garlic at least submitted and we can at least make sure that we have met the minimums of whatever that would call for so we reduce the likelihood that we wind up getting disrupted in a year and a half right um, i don't think we we'll, i don't think we will get disrupted if anything it could be watered down in the state and ours might okay. end up being tighter but okay. uh, in the meantime we've All you right. know people have been trained and <laughs> and uh, thinking about it it's it's being driven now by the industry groups to see the writing on the wall. By default, she's alluded to 80 to 90 towns have done it because the state has failed to act. And the last one is Boston, which is the 800-pound elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. So now various industries that utilize these uh, want, they, they've given up the fight to, to try and derail it, but what they want is they want predictability, they want the least restriction. So I, I would concur mm -hmm. with the Andrea that the state statute is, is likely to be pushed as preemptive and is likely to be the minimum standard that that the industry can convince the legislators to pass. Right. So uh, as one of the things that, that we do as selectmen or we go to a legislative breakfast that are put on by the Mass Municipal Association, and the last one that I went to over in Framingham, the legislators reported on the fact that they are getting more sponsors of the plastic bag bill every year and the, and they, they just said basically it's coming that's right yeah so my questions for you is do we need to do a public hearing with it no. oh, okay um and then the the recycling committee the transfer station recycling committee is sponsoring this and we we're wondering if you would like to co-sponsor that with them this article as a selectman i'm happy to do that yeah yeah i'll see why not that would be awesome. That would be great. 
Thank you very much. Appreciate it. We need a motion. I think we can just add it to the, to the war the next time. And I, I'll just echo what my colleague said. I really appreciate all the work you've put in and the way you've gone about this. I mean, a lot of people have concerns and issues and things that they have opinions about, but to actually translate that into doing the actual work necessary is much appreciated, and, and thank you. We have a great committee, and Megan Sullivan is pretty much <laughs> running the show. Um, but anyway, it's a great committee, and I appreciate your time. I thank did you take very much. The, I did take the initiative because because it is as strict as it is, uh, I contacted the Attorney General's office and, and they, they're the gatekeeper, so if they said no, it wouldn't be any good. They say yes, we're still not immune from a challenge, but at least you got, you've gotten to the gate, and in this case, they've, they've indicated they would approve it in this form. Okay. Just, just because you made that statement, Mark, can I make a, a, a for people listening, I actually think that what we have is a, is a, a very benign bylaw. There are some people that are worried about where will I put my sandwich, you know, are the sandwich bags going away, what my newspaper is going to get stuck in the rain. And in fact, this is focused on checkouts, it's focused on takeout counters of restaurants. Right. Right. It's not the pet plastic bag around the newspaper, it's not the thing that the glad the sandwich bags. Yeah. Uh, so in that sense, it maybe it's more aggressive than what the state will eventually come up with. But for anybody out there who's worried that this is right. kind of a really draconian, it's not. It's not. Yeah. It's not. Thank you. Thank you. Now, yeah. Medfield Historical Commission. Gentlemen. Pass out a couple of things. Uh, before it started. Uh, first of all, because I know you don't have enough paper. Uh, Thank you. For, for everything that you're doing. Hi, I, I'm Dan Bible. I'm the co-chair of the uh, Medfield Historic Commission. And what we're uh, presenting for you tonight is a proposed change in the bylaws uh, dealing with historic demolition. Um, to give you a little background, we've, uh, the, the, the bylaws been in effect in, in Medfield since 1993. And over that period of time, we've allowed demolition to go forward in about 80% of the time. We, we haven't uh, disallowed that. Um, in the vast majority of cases. We have a new uh, building commissioner in town, and the, uh, the letter that we, we got from him, uh, David Temple, the other co-chair, and I met with Gary Pelletier to uh, go over what we, were, what we had been doing in town and uh, had a very productive meeting with him. And in response to that, he, he sent us this letter which said basically the uh, state building code does not have a definition for either demolition or partial demolition. And our bylaw uh, does, have, does mention that. In fact, it specifically states that uh, demolition and partial demolition as defined by the State Building Code. Well, for whatever reason, the State Building Code at some point in the recent past eliminated uh, definitions of both of those terms. And so our bylaws talk about something which doesn't exist in the state uh, building codes anymore. And uh, as a result of that, um, we, we only get uh, demolition applications from the building commissioner for total demolitions of properties, which we think is, is problematic. Uh, in response to this, David and I met with Christine and Mark Sorrell to discuss some proposed changes in the language of the bylaw, which we think would uh, eliminate this uh, uh, non-existent uh, state building code reference, but also give more clarity to builders and homeowners. And if you turn to this, uh, this handout, the presentation to the selectmen, it talks about what the current language in the bylaw is says a demolition permit is the permit issued by the commissioner as required by the state building code for the demolition, partial demolition, or removal of a building or structure. Um, as I pointed out, 
There is no such definition in the State Building Code. I've reached out to, the, to that organization. I've asked uh, if they can explain that or they can give us any information about that. I've never heard back from them. So with, with the uh, uh, really helpful uh, recommendations from Mark, we've come up with, with uh, this, the second page, the uh, proposed language, that a demolition permit would be any permit issued by the commissioner for work which includes demolition and or reconstruction in whole or in part of a building or structure. That would replace the language at 150-13 uh, in the uh, Met, town of Medfield bylaw. And he's all, Mark has also suggested that we add the second uh, language on what a demolition is and also what it isn't. So a demolition is the act of pulling down, destroying, or remove, removing or razzing any or all significant portion of a regulated building or structure as defined in section 15014 of this bylaw. And if you see this next section, it says what it doesn't include, which I think is really important. Demolition shall not include modifications to the interior of a building or structure having no effect on the exterior. Demolition shall not include work that could be considered repair, including replacement of exterior siding, windows, doors, chimneys, awning, gutters, bounce, downspouts, light fixtures, etc. We think that this helps, this will help in two ways. Number one, it removes this language in our town bylaws, which refers to the state building code because it doesn't exist. And if anyone looked to the state building code to find out what a demo or partial demolition would be, they wouldn't be able to find it. And uh, secondly, uh, the, uh, we believe this change clarifies the process both for applicants uh, and for builders and for homeowners uh, and is more in line with current standards. Uh, the other uh, handout which, which I gave you uh, with this t listing of towns, I didn't do an exhaustive search of every town in the Commonwealth on what they talked about with uh, a demolition or partial demolition, but a number of towns also have this language of the state building code. So I think another, a number of towns are going to have a continuing problem like this. Uh, but I think the language that, that we wrote with Mark's help, I think, is in line with the language which many communities have which gives clarity to homeowners and to builders on what is covered and what isn't covered. Um, I'd be happy to answer any <coughs> questions that, that you might have about this. Pete? So that there, have you made a list of the towns that, that are defining that by the state building code? Well, I, this is not a complete list, but, uh, but these towns do define it by the uh, uh, many of them. You have the term as defined by the state, state building, building code, code in there. It's not be good if we could notify them. I, I think you can explain this. This is one of those things. Demolition permits, I, I believe, originated with Mass Historic some years ago, and they probably put to put out a sample, and a number of communities adopted it at that time, and then did or did not updated as time went on. There definitely, until relatively recently, was a definition of at least demolition in the state building code, if not partial demolition. It was removed two, I think, two or three additions back. So that's why some it's still in there. And then it's an issue, how much of an issue in each town in their practice uh, in terms of what ends up before the Historic Commission. Yeah. Is there some easy way to notify these towns? Not really. Uh, all right. Well, that's what I was thinking. I think um, the, the other thing in the uh, in this handout, the uh, presentation, the last two pages show what the uh, what we've gotten from the uh, building commissioner. Uh, the first one is um, an application for mit, for permit to demolish a structure. Uh, which is what we'd been receiving in the past. This is sort of a, a, a specific Medfield 
uh, type application. But the, the, the last page is something which uh, we have gotten from the building commissioner recently, which is uh, developed by the, the Massachusetts, uh, I'm sorry, the Board of Building Regulations and Standards, which is a standard application which says, building permit application to construct, repair, renovate, or demolish a one or two family structure. And I think this seems to indicate to me that the building commissioner may understand that there is a need to have a uniform um, form which deals with both demolition and uh, renovation. And renovation is, I suppose, one way that we could look at partial demolition. Yes? I have a question about two words. Yes, sir. Um, in the proposed language. Uh, and this is a lay person, so Mark may weigh in on the legal stuff. In the first first paragraph around the demolition permit, it's a permit which includes demolition and or reconstruction. And when I saw reconstruction, I hung up on that first off because it wasn't in the old wording, and second because I don't actually know what reconstruction in a legal sense means because that seemed like an overly broad. I was picturing that you could be reconstructing something that's there which is maybe covered under the repair clause here, but I was trying to figure out what constitutes reconstruction versus putting new siding. It was in renovation house. before, so it was a better word. The word they, they were suggesting was renovation, I believe, and I suggested reconstruction was, would give more of a flavor of what they were talking about, which was fairly extensive work. Okay, uh, but, well, okay, that, so that's the, the line that I'm seeking yes. is the understanding of what constitutes extensive work. I, there's there's I mean, no real way, I think, that you're going to, there's got to be some common sense here. We've been dealing with this going back to several building commissioners, wrestling with situations yeah. Yeah. Uh, until the, the current one, the current building commissioner just basically raised this issue of, it's, you know, you're referring to the state code and the code doesn't apply to it. The past inspectors up until now has been working relationships in terms of what yeah. would and wouldn't qualify. Yeah. And, and I, I, I want to say also that, that uh, uh, the building commissioner was very open with us and we had a, I think we had a, a good meeting. I don't, think he's, I don't think he's being obstructionist. I think he's looking at, at the code. He's looking at the, at the state building code and he's saying there is no language there. Mm -hmm. And he's, try, he's trying to find clarity as well. So I don't think he's being uh, difficult in any way. I think he's trying to do a, the, as good a job as he can. Yeah, I'm not arguing what you're trying to do. My reaction just as a layperson reading it right. was when I got to the word reconstruction, it was like, I don't know. Right. And then right. my second word is the word et cetera under the, under the <laughs> exceptions. But because, and I'll tell you, I, I don't know what I'm talking about here. I'm not a building guy that does a lot of work, but the picture I had is, okay, I have a house with a front porch it has wooden posts, you know, and is roofed over, and it has railings. And I decide, maybe the railings are rotting out, and I decide that I'm going to remove all of those posts, replace right. them with new posts, not change the footprint, really not change the aesthetics of the building. Right. Maybe that's reconstruction, but if I don't want to have to go after a demolition permit, I'm going to say it's an et cetera. And so I, I'm trying to... So, so understand, there's two things here. The building commissioner wears two hats. He wears a hat enforcing the state code. The state code is an area where the state has preempted local, local municipalities. Mm -hmm. So then you've got the uh, demolition delay bylaw, which is under home rule authority and doesn't purport to interfere with the construction stuff that's in the state building code. Mm -hmm. So we've got different definitions for different purposes right. here. Yep. So it, with, with what you're proposing to do, you'd have to go to the building commissioner for a determination anyway as to what you were proposing to do just under the state code. Mm -hmm. The issue is, would he feel obligated based on this local bylaw to say, wait a minute, this comes within the de definitions in the demolition delay bylaw, so I can't do anything until you go clear it with the historic mm -hmm. commission. And that's... That's how the process would work. And I think one of the other problems that we have, if you look through the, um, what, we, what I put together from other towns, in some cases they talk about a percent, like 25% of a building. Well, 
on, a, on one hand, you say, well, that's a clear definition of what a, a, a partial demolition is. On the other hand, who's going out there with a, with a yardstick? You know, I think, I think there's got to be a, an open working relationship between the building commissioner and us or any other entity in town about how to interpret this. I, I understand your point. Um, we can take out the et cetera. I'm not a, I don't have a problem yeah, with that. But, but, uh, but I, my point has <laughs> more, I'm not, I'm not advocating for a change. I just read this thing and said, well, I don't really know what this bylaw means. Right. Um, well, there's a so rule not, of, I'm not actually trying to there, there's a rule of ordinance and bylaw construction that basically says that when you have a listing and then you put et cetera, then that basically it's shorthand for similar types of things. So. You're not going to give us the Latin mark? Right. <laughs> There's so, a Latin phrase for it. There is. I know there is. I can't think of it. Here's what I think, here's what I think I'm hearing. Yes, sir. I, and I'm, not, I'm not rejecting it. I'm just trying to understand. We have words in this bylaw that are open to or subject to interpretation, reconstruction being yeah. one of them, et cetera, being another one. Yeah. Um, this bylaw is expressing an intent of the town. That intent is carried out by the building inspector, who will undoubtedly work in good faith to make decisions in accordance with what he believes the bylaw is calling on the town, the, the an owner to do. Now, if, if some owner, you know, strenuously resisted and wanted to take it to court, we wouldn't have like ironclad bright lines on what it is we can do and what it is we can't do. It would all be a question of who wants to push how hard to get their way and what's worth and what's not worth mm -hmm. fighting over. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, we've actually made a process because we had some controversy. So it, it basically is an appeal now mm -hmm. from the Commission to you folks, the yes. Board of Selectmen, yes. to try to resolve it, right. and only then would it go to court. Oh, great. We get to decide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. and, in, and in, in fact, in that case, uh, the the Selectmen did overrule the the Historic Commission about a, a demolition delay, and, uh, and that was a total demo. Yes, that was a total demo. But yeah, there there was an appeal process, and I think. Working cooperatively with the commissioner is is the right way to do this. Uh, you're right. Uh, people can object to almost anything, uh, but what, that's why we we do have this demolition shall not include section yeah. mm -hmm. because I think it covers the vast majority of things. And if you uh, right now the. If you're doing an, an alteration or renovation, it's an online application that the commissioner has that you can look at and you see, you don't know exactly what's being done, but you see the dollar value. And you have things that are $500 or $1,000. These are probably replacing the railing. And you see some things which are $100,000 and you say, that's, that's a, a much more significant change in a, in a structure. Okay. So I, and I will say, I, I think this is a, a good way to do it. And I, I have some of the same concerns that Gus has in terms of the drafting of this. But I think given that this is a locally administered bylaw, if this is the way a federal um, regulation was written, I would think it should <laughs> not be permitted to be written this way. I don't think any federal regulation should be allowed to be written this way. And I'm generally opposed to administrative discretion of all kinds. But when it's being done locally, right, I mean, it, it, it is clear enough for a bylaw to be administered by a commission that is dedicated to the preservation of historic buildings in the town of Medfield, that's accountable by appointment to the Board of Selectmen, is accountable by election to the people of the town. Yeah. And so um, this is the sort of body that in a well-functioning society and government should exercise some measure of discretion. And I have confidence that you will interpret reconstruction and et cetera, kind of consistent with what the the thrust of this bylaw is. I think you always like to cite the statistic when you come in these things about how many of these things you approve. <laughs> um, and I think it's good that you do, right? Because I think it's a recognition that yeah. you're not just there to say no to everything, right? I and mean, you are exercising discretion in good faith. You're recognizing the difference between a genuinely historic building and one that's not, between a demolition or a reconstruction that's going to enhance and improve yeah. the overall historic character of the Thank town, you. one that won't. Thank and so I, I think that. as long as 
we continue to do as good a job as we have done historically in appointing members of the Historical Commission, I, I'm not too worried that this is going to be a, um, a huge problem. And that's really what it is. It, it's making sure you have people with good judgment who are applying this. And, and we well, serve at your discretion, sir. Uh, but I also want to say that we— Although I do remember after that incident, when I was not neither of us were on the board at the time, <laughs> you did propose a bylaw to reduce the ability of the selectmen to overturn the Historic Commission, which was passed. I, I, don't, I, I, remember. Don't, I don't actually recall that, but I, 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 I do want to say that, that, that over, over the, the past several years, we've gotten a lot of very good advice from, from uh, Mark about what we can do and what we can't do, and I think we're, we're trying to do as, as good a job as we can to do exactly that, to respect the rights of property owners to do what, what, what he or she wants to do, but also to preserve and protect the, the things that we, we think are important about Medfield. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, can I raise a totally different topic, but it's appropriate because Mr. Temple is here, and I was going to do it in my selectman report, but while he's here, I'd like to raise it. All right, please do. The topic is, this is, this is housekeeping around a water bill. <laughs> now, so, well, you want to refresh us on the water bill issue? No, what what, no, no, what no, water no, bill are you no, talking no, about? <laughs> I, 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 have, I have two questions. One, do we need to take in, of course, Christine walked out of the room because she probably know, but maybe Evelyn, you'll know. Um, a, do we need to actually take any action on committing the money to pay the water bill, which is currently outstanding? Because we said we would do it, but then... I thought we voted. Did we not we vote, did vote No, time? we voted to do it, yeah. but, um, but we voted that we would take on the responsibility we didn't actually vote to appropriate any money. So I, I would have brought it up in the selectman's report, but seeing as you all are here, then we well, all know what's going on. It's not on the agenda. So no, it's on the selectman's report. Right, but, it, but if, if, if we're going to vote, if we have to vote to appropriate money, we've got to put but it on the agenda. That's quite all right. Yeah. This, is, this is a question for information that I'm asking, and I'm sure that the uh, members of the Stay historical back. commission will Stay sleep back. better knowing this. Yeah. So, you heard it. OK. So do we need to take it? Does the, no, it's just going to get taken care of. We will pay the okay. bill. Second question then is, do we need to do anything administratively to make sure that the water department knows not to send the water bill to Mr. Temple, but rather to send it to somewhere here where we're likely to get it? You can handle that. They're going to walk it right upstairs to me. Okay. Okay. So you know where you stand. I know where we stand. I'm happy, and we didn't need any votes. I, I was just wondering why there was one of those big pool-filling tanker trucks parked outside the Historical <laughs> Society <laughs> filling up. I don't know whose that was, but... <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I, did, I, I just had um, one, one comment on, on the uh, demolition thing. Quit while you're ahead. It was a, 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 a remarkably perverse consequence of the, the, the way it is set up now. Right now, it, demolition, they, the uh, building, building commissioners are instructed to follow the dictionary definition of what is demolition. So uh, uh, and what requires, requires a demolition permit. In other words, it, 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 it's completely obliterating the building. Um, and in the past, uh, in numerous occasions, the Historical Commission has had demolition applications from builders who wanted to tear down a, a building that had some historical significance. And we, uh, we would reach uh, accommodations with them that uh, if they preserved this most historic part of the building, uh, they could then uh, tear down the rest of it and be on with their business. And it, everybody was happy. Uh, but under the present uh, conditions of demolition, the owner of that new building could, if he or she wanted to, tear down the historic part of the building, and the, the mm. commission would never be even aware of it. Mm. That's, it's kind of a perverse consequence. Mm. I still agree that it's a good idea. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, action items. Vote to appoint Richard Hooker and George Darrell to the Conservation Commission. I was glad to see that we had um, some interested folks who look like they'd be good additions to the commissions. Any questions, comments, concerns about uh, Mr. Hooker or Mr. Darrell? I, I can vouch for Mr. Hooker that I'd be happy to have him serve in any capacity for the town that he would so choose. So okay. Pete, anything? I'm fine with both of them. We have a motion. I move that we appoint uh, Richard Hooker and George Darrell to the Conservation Commission. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We also have a request to appoint Cynthia Green and Matt Triest. Triest? Trist. Trist, yeah, to the um, uh, Master Planning 
the, yeah, the Townwide Master Planning Committee. Again, I was happy to see both of these individuals to have an owner of a business in town and, and someone from the uh, Energy Committee with energy experience interested in this as well. So I have, I have, or Pete, I don't know if you have any comments for Pete. No, I think they're both excellent people. I have a question for the the three of us. Uh, <clears throat> Matt had reached out to me, and I know he reached out to you, Pete, but a couple months ago he had reached out to me because he was interested in serving on the Economic Development Committee, uh, which as a local business owner makes a lot of sense. The for only for me, it was a little different. He was interested in the downtown. Well, uh, with the idea that there's not two things. He may have said downtown. I I blended those two committees because I didn't. We, we had talked about replacing the committee. We certainly hadn't talked about replacing two committees with two committees. So I, I just blended them together. The, the, the reason I bring this up is because in appointing him to this committee, are we kind of implicitly saying we're not going to create a downtown committee or an economic development committee in, uh, in the next year? Therefore, if somebody who was a local businessman wanted to have an impact on downtown, this would be the logical place for a volunteer to do that, because that's what he had originally expressed an interest in doing. Uh, if, if we're not going to have that committee anytime soon, I think it would be great to have him on this. If we are going to have it, uh, I don't know for sure that he wants to serve on two committees, so uh, just because I knew the background here. Did he reach out, Evelyn, to express interest in this committee? Sarah talked to him. Sarah. Yeah. Sarah did. Mm -hmm. Because the downtown committee is so this Has is my point. So Sarah told him, well, we're not going to have a downtown committee, so if you want to do something, your future, right? like this, mm -hmm. that's, my, that's the exact question I'm yeah. raising. Yeah. Uh, it's not so Sarah's very, call. Was, that, but, I, don't, you know. I don't think she was making the call yeah. to not have the downtown study committee. I think they had a conversation about the townwide master planning committee, and he seemed interested in that, too. So she asked if he'd put his name forward. I don't think he was, she was eliminating him from... Okay. Downtown, but I can I can ask her. I think she know. might still be here. No, he, I, I, it wasn't so much that I was reacting to that. They both want to serve. I think that's great. It was more I wanted to raise the point with us. Does this mean that we don't really plan to move ahead quickly with another downtown committee, and that this is the thing we? I'm okay with that if it is. It's just that I don't want to default into it. Do you have a thought on that? I, I keep thinking that it would uh, behoove the town to, to have a, a, a committee that does focus on the downtown. Uh, mm. and, I, and I know that it just it hasn't been on Sarah's agenda to do it, but uh, I think it is something that should get done. But, so I never raised it for the couple months that I heard from Matt because it just seemed like we had enough going on without throwing another thing on the agenda. It may be what we want to do is just defer that question until we get to the new fiscal year and we go through the board reappointment process and then that's the time to talk about whether we want to reform that committee or not. I'm okay with that. I, uh, as I said, it was just that I knew what he originally said he wanted to serve on and when he showed up here for this committee, I was saying, well, does that mean we're just not going to do anything? I met with Sarah. Yeah. And they went through the whole, you know, scenario. Of the yeah. downtown committee went as far as it could, well, you know, for the present time. Because they, they went to all the merchants right. to find out what their feelings were, you know, looking. So I'm going to suggest to we just table the downtown committee until yes. we get to reappointments. Um, and I wanted to make sure we actually knew that that was a decision we made. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't think, I don't have an opinion on whether we ought to have a downtown committee or not. I, I think it's, to your point, I don't think there's any sense that we're going to be looking to create one in the next four months, yep. right? That's and so, I mean, my view on it is the same as it was before, that I'm not opposed to it. But I think the issue the last time with both the downtown committee and the economic development committee is they didn't really have a mission or a charter. And so I think if we come up with a mission for a downtown committee, I'm all for it. Mm -hmm. But I think just to appoint one to say, now you all go look at the downtown, I don't, you know. I, th I think the businesses in downtown could do that on their own without needing any sort of government imprimatur or the restrictions of the open meeting law. So if, they, if, they, if there are people who want to do that, they can do that through memo or otherwise. And if there's some kind of government-sponsored mission we want to give them, that would be okay. fine. So I don't think this rules that out. Yep. And, okay. But I, I, I think it's great that he there's business questions for and the downtown questions in the master plan as well. So okay. um, I think it's great that he's interested. Thanks. We have a motion. Yep. I move that we appoint Cynthia Green and Matt Triest. 
to the Townwide Master Planning Committee. Second. All in favor? Yes. And I think that brings us that is, to that I'm 15. filling in your last two on the website. That's it. There you have a full go. committee. We have a full committee. Wonderful. Well, welcome. All right. Uh, so we have now our ongoing uh, 2020 budget review and discussions, town finance discussion, and potentially, I don't know if we're actually going to be in a position to vote to approve preliminary town budgets, but... Uh, Christine, do you want to? Let me just, I, I just right. let me run and grab uh, okay. Gus's, yeah. yeah. Oh. So I, I've updated, well, Christine's getting that. I've updated that framework that we've been kind of looking at. Um, still loose ends, still trying to narrow some things down. Uh, but when, she, when, she's, when you see it, we'll talk a little bit about it. We still have a pretty big gap. To close to get to if we're if we're going to avoid prop two and a half override we still have a pretty big gap to get to um and we just and there's also a few questions that we have as selectmen uh one of which right now the the spreadsheet is carrying uh the uh, stabilization fund at a million dollars technically we could make it a million twenty five thousand if we wanted to um, given what the bottom line looks like i would say we maybe don't want to but because uh, there's enough other there's enough gas being poured on this fire. So at the bottom, you can see um, where we have where we are right now. Overall, it's about a 1.2 million dollar gap to close. Um, let me comment on in, in the way that breaks out is uh, on this sheet shows 522 thousand on the town side and 685 thousand on the school side. I want to, if anybody's listening, and certainly among the three of us, I want you to understand how this sheet works. As I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, the historic trend has been of the town budget as I've defined it here in the school budget, as it's defined here, we have had a remarkably stable split of 71% of the funds going to the school side and 29% going to the town side. This spreadsheet actually is set up to preserve that split. So what happens is if if say the town side should suddenly get it, you know, we 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 up our projected revenues by five hundred thousand dollars, the way that would actually play out in the spreadsheet is seventy one percent of that would be driving down the school's shortfall, and twenty nine percent would be affecting the the town's shortfall. Because it, so in a way, when we first start talking about this, I think Mike, you made the point. Well, gee, it's the town trying to make this all work. It's like, yeah, that's exactly what this is doing. It's we're trying to, the, the real number is that 1.2 million number in terms of understanding how that hits both sides. The numbers that you see to the left of that mm -hmm. are giving you a sense of that. But it's, what'll happen is if you make a change on one side, you actually see a change happen on both sides because of the split. Mm -hmm. So on the point of the contribution of the municipal stabilization fund, uh, my, I would favor increasing it this year. I, mean, I think as long as we have that long-term uh, obligation, I think we ought to view the contribution of the municipal stabilization fund in light of the long-term obligation, not in light of the annual. I, mean, I think one of the things I think we all have been trying to work towards is move away from allowing kind of long-term issues to be sacrificed to short-term mm -hmm. problems. And so I view, if you look at sort of our, our long-term unfunded liabilities, whether it's OPEB, um, and you know, OPEB are, are buildings and just kind of general reserves. I, I view that stabilization fund contribution as money against one of those mm -hmm. long-term obligations. So I wouldn't. I, I would move it up to twenty-five thousand dollars until we get feedback from the facilities report that it's sort of sufficiently funded that we don't need to increase it. Anymore. I mean, I think that's you know, that's how I view that. Um, do you, you have any thoughts on that? I, I would incline to go along with that. Yeah. To, to, I think that that's something that we really need to be focused on is maintaining the the, uh, the infrastructure. So, so let me make a counter argument, but not to talk you out of your position. Just to just to give you the other side of the consideration, as I've thought about it, we um, I, I actually agree with your philosophy there around the stabilization fund. So I, I don't disagree with that. We also last year we also passed a financial policy with regard to free cash that we would not allow the budget to allow free cash to go below one and three quarter million dollars. Now, we, we compromised on that last year because we kind of adopted that policy just as we were going to the town meeting and it didn't seem reasonable to suddenly throw that entire burden on all at once. That burden right now is hitting this budget. 
and the consequence of it hitting this budget, I don't know if you got an updated number, Christine, but the normal final article that we have where we normally apply $500,000 to reduce the tax rate, there is no $500,000 because we've drawn a line at one and three quarter million. So um, it's not that I'm, I'm arguing against the one, you know, one million twenty-five thousand. It's that we made some decisions over the past year uh, that are policies, and I think we should mm. stick with our policies. But I think as we think about that, given that we're by this spreadsheet, at least with the numbers we have, one point two million in the whole. It might make more sense to phase in our yeah, policy, so and make I, it a goal. I, I don't want us to do that yet, but I, I, I would think we should think about that when we get a little closer to brass tacks. So I will say I, I have thought about that, um, and I think the one point seven five was an effort towards phasing it in, um, in the sense that uh, I think when we have the discussions, and if you look at what the numbers are, it should be higher. And you know, the 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 reason we don't have the five hundred thousand dollars in here is not because of anything that's in this budget, or not because of anything that's specific to this year. Um, it's a structural issue in our spending, and it's because we used a, in last year's quote unquote balanced budget, we used about four hundred thousand dollars extra in free cash, uh, mm -hmm. over and above than what was necessary, mm -hmm. and so. We would have that extra four hundred thousand dollars if the balanced budget that had had gone into the warrant report last year was actually a balanced budget, rather than a budget that was balanced with an extra four hundred thousand dollars in free cash. And so, whatever whatever year we make this determination, if we're actually going to stick to a policy of trying to to maintain our, or sort of shore up our rapidly depleting reserves, um, it's going to be painful. And so, uh, next year's going to be exactly the same. Right, I mean, there's no, everyone says, well, this is a bad year, this is bad, it's not a bad year. Right? It's a structural budget issue. And you can view it as a structural spending issue, you can view it as a structural revenue issue, you can view it however you want. It's a structural issue that the costs of providing the, the same level of services to which we are accustomed and, and to which we have all voted ourselves to receive um, are going up higher than the naturally increasing revenues that we have. And so if we want to maintain those same level of services, we've got to either raise taxes uh, or we've got to find a way to uh, deliver those services at lower cost, which ultimately means delivering the same services with fewer employees, since most of our budget is personnel. And so I don't think we ought to, and again, we, we get, we've gotten where we are, which is not in a terrible place. It's not, like we're in a terrible place. it's not like we've been poorly managed, but we are where we are. Because we have, if you look over the last three or four years, we have used a substantial amount of free cash. We have used that $500,000 article has been much higher than $500,000 pretty much every year. We use a substantial amount of free cash um, to fund the feasibility study around the public safety building. We did not do an, the, sort of the two override vote around the public safety building. We used a lot of free cash to fund the first part of that. And so uh, my own view um, is that if we want to continue to have these level of services and we, we can't deliver them with uh, at lower expense and with, with uh, fewer um, employees, then we, we have to sort of bite the bullet and pay for them because as the chart I circulated last year showed, you know, our reserves are going down a lot. And so when we are going, going to be going out to the bond market in two or three years for one of the larger bond issues we've done, if we don't stick to this, our reserves are going to be a, probably a quarter of what they were the last time we did it. And the last time we did it, we got an excellent bond rating. And one of the things that was cited in our excellent bond rating was the size of our reserves. And that was driven in large part by the SBAB fund, which is depleting as planned, and which the bond rating agency recognized in 2015 would be depleting as planned. Well, now it will be depleted. It will be, will be going to the bond market in 2023 with the exact same tax mix that we have, the exact same set of spending that we have, uh, but much lower reserves. And so if we do not work now, to continue shoring up those reserves and continue preparing to make sure we're in good financial position, which includes having the kind of policy we adopted and sticking to that policy, we're going to get a lower bond rating and we're going to have a much greater borrowing expense at a time where we're doing one of the big, most biggest borrowings that we're doing. So I, I get your point entirely, but I, I don't think we should. You know, we, we need to take our medicine now. The economy is really good. Unemployment's really low. You know, it's never going to be easier than it is now. We have four points in response. Okay. 
the first one, your sensitivity to making sure that when we have to go out in, after bonds that we're in, in good financial shape to do that. Totally agree. And so that's something that we ought to be thinking about now uh, and, and doing what we need to do to set that up. But to your points, a couple of things. First off, the free cash that we used, while it was used for a lot of different purposes, uh, we used it for a lot of different purposes at a time when the free cash balance was going up. So if we have a free cash balance that's going up, effectively what that's saying is we budgeted and taxed people for more than we actually needed into the credit of the town rather than just chew that money up, it was returned. And therefore that, that flow, in and flow and outflow of free cash to the extent that seeing the balance go up is indications that we actually overshot the taxing. It doesn't bother me to sit there and have that flow back through uh, because effectively the reason it went up is because we actually collected more taxes than we really needed. Mm -hmm. So that, on that point. Um, on the, the budget being the same in 2023, that's not quite true because the, if we don't have any more bonds that we float between now and 2023, we'll continue to have the current debt rolling off. So aside from the operating side of the budget, the principal and debt side, mm -hmm. the debt service, it, it went down consider a couple hundred thousand this year. That's still going to continue to go down, I think, out to 2022. Well, it goes down every year. It goes, goes down every year, but I mean, there was there were a couple of years where it was a precipitous decline. And my only point there is that at least that's something that's flowing in a positive direction for us. So I would, I would. Right. Well, we don't, keep we, don't that money. we don't get quite the tax benefit from it because a lot of that is is funded by the SPV account. So taxpayers aren't paying the full amount of those bonds that are rolling off. So, uh, so you're saying that the income side are, will go down because of that? Right. That's fair. Right. That's fair. Uh, and then the only other point I'll make is the kind of the point I just made. It's like we made a number of decisions and changes. So the fact that you're, the fact you're saying we need to bite the bullet and get serious about having discipline, I agree with that. The argument that I would make, or at least the, the question I would raise is, and does that mean we absolutely want to do all of it this year? And here's where I'm looking at right now. These numbers are undoubtedly going to get better over the next month. But right now it says we have a $1.2 million gap. Mm -hmm. um, I'm speculating that the taxpayers are not going to be particularly warm to the idea of passing another override this year. I could be wrong. I was vastly wrong last year, so I could be wrong for a second year in a row. But if that speculation on my part is true, then what we have, for argument's sake right now, we have to close a $1.2 million gap and with taxpayers who will not accept an override. I'm making it up, but I'm thinking that might happen. If that's the case, the actions we're going to have to take to close a $1.2 million gap all in one year, all recognizing all of our recently adopted policies, is going to require some action. And I'm raising the question, if we were a little bit gentler in how we phased it in, Maybe it wouldn't require that the kind of what I would call pretty harsh action that we'd have to take to make this work. I'm not suggesting that we decide not to do that now. I'm just I'm, I'm looking a month out and saying when we get to everything's been tightened up as much as it can be, and we're looking at what we could do or what we don't want to do. That's on my mind. That uh, mm -hmm. we can still get where we need to go, but we might try to ease the pain a little bit over more than one year. Pete, I I would. Uh hope that the numbers will improve, as Gus says, over the next couple of months. And, uh, and I guess I, my suggestion would be that we just look at this and try to figure it out later. <laughs> yeah. I mean, here, here's what I would say to that. I mean, if, if the numbers improve to the point where it's a $200,000 gap, you know, I, I'm not going to dive on my sword to insist that we have a $200,000 override vote, mm -hmm. right? It's probably not worth the $8,000 to hold the election. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I don't know that it's, it's going to improve that much. And so what we're really just going to be faced with is kind of kicking the can down the road another year and hoping that we overtax enough this year to generate enough free cash to use again next year, right? Because I agree with you, mm -hmm. you know, but, but I think the, the reality is if, if we had kind of looked at this a little differently a couple of years ago, we could have said, well, instead of all of that free cash going to fund what are essentially operational items and to kind of keep the budget going, you know, we could have 
transferred that to the stabilization fund mm -hmm. instead, right? And we could have kind of staunched the bleeding on the reserves starting a couple of years ago. We could have increased the OPUB then. So, I mean, I think, mm -hmm. uh, again, that's 2020 hindsight. I'm not really interested in like dissecting what we did or we didn't do. But I think if, if the number is still $800,000, you know, I don't see how we dip the free cash down to nine hundred thousand dollars, whatever else it is, yeah. um, to say we we can't do it. And I, I think the the override question, and and, it, and the way we presented it at town meeting last year, we can pre present it again at town meeting this year. Is you look, you present this is what these are the services you get without an override, and you decide if if, if you can live with these services without an override, you do. If you want those more services, then you have to vote for an override and pay for it, right? I mean, and it's it 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 it. It's a stark presentation, but it's a clear presentation to the people of the town as to what they value more. Do they value kind of keeping their taxes, you know, a little bit lower than they would be, or do they value the services that those $1.2 million would buy? And, and, but I think just from my perspective in, in presenting it, I don't think we can pretend that, that there isn't a larger picture here that we need to keep our eye on. And I, and I, think, people will under, I think people will understand that. But. But we're not that far apart. Yeah. Because you said you wouldn't, you wouldn't force an override for two hundred thousand. In my head, I think last year we took it down to about one and a quarter million, and I wouldn't want to take it down even that far. You know, we need we need to be making progress. So my max would have been five hundred thousand as it was. So now we're you, yeah. between what I'm trying to say and what you're trying to say is some number in between two hundred thousand and five hundred thousand. It's yeah. not taking eight hundred thousand out. So right. we're good. No, I think that's we're good. That's right. right. And the only thing I didn't say, where on here, Gus, is the stabilization fund contribution? Uh, it is on the first page. It's a two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand. Uh, it's if you no, that one, that's the wrong three hundred thousand. If you go to uh, where is it? Christine, it's under an know. operating budget. Uh, the stabilization operating is an budget? operating budget. Or, or was it? You're talking about the uh, the uh, this one, the million? No, it's three. No. It should be three hundred thousand. Three hundred thousand. It's I'm carrying it three hundred thousand. It's in a. It's in the operating budget. So you're carrying it just as your town department budgets. Okay, so that that should be above the line. It, uh, it like is. the stabilization fund shouldn't be a, a town budget. It's here. Oh. Wait, uh, I could swear it's in here. Christine. Oh, you have it on the top, but there's no, there's nothing in it. It says plan stabilization fund contribution to the budget. No, no that's, that's revenue that's coming out. That's, that's in right. here. Oh, sorry, I'm no, looking at the wrong thing. Side. It's here. It's got to be here. It's three hundred thousand because you upped it from two hundred thousand yeah, to three hundred thousand, right and I just can't find it. <clears throat> that's the one thing that jumped out at me. As, as otherwise, but otherwise, thank you for updating this, and I'll yep. look at it again. Um, so, do we have anything else in specific budgets, Christine? It sounded like from our conversation before that next time. No, I think there's a couple of things we need to we need to plan on, um, and we need to look at what our March schedule meeting dates are. I think one of the things I met with the department heads. Um, we had a department head meeting last week, and I asked them to submit uh, budget cuts to me um, as soon as possible. I know they're all working on it. Um, I think we need to look at the issue of raising fees um, in terms of revenue. And one of the things I worked with the transfer station and recycling committee is whether or not um, we go to $100 for a two-year sticker fee. Um, they're currently $75 for the two years. Um, they thought it was reasonable to have $100 for two years. It's a dollar a week to use the transfer station, basically, then. Um, Cemetery Commission it would like to raise their fees, and they need to come to a meeting to have you authorize that. Um, Evelyn and I talked today about whether or not we should take a look at what we charge for our alcohol licenses. That might be something we need to, to increase compared to what other towns have done. We haven't done that in a very long time. Um, and our solicitation fees as well. We only charge $10 per person if you're going to go do door to door solicitation. So it's probably on the low side as well. Um, so while we're talking about cutting budgets, we should probably also looking at uh, other ways in which we can do some revenue. So I will say, I'll oh, go ahead, Pete. I've always been concerned with the, uh, the cemetery uh, fees because we are committing to perpetuity. And mm -hmm. so then, and that's not much to buy a cemetery plot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Our, our problem is that we're, the state funds are going down. It's very clear that we're, we're kind of like stuck in a box and we're, we're looking at what we can do in our budgets, but fundamentally that's not where the problem really emanates from. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a combination of the uncontrollable benefits costs, but uh, more than that, more consistently than that, it's the, 
it's almost like the state is cutting back on funds for towns like ours until we sink to the point that we are then below average or in, and then grovel. And then suddenly we'll need help. And uh, it just needs to be a different way of thinking about that. I think of all of those items you mentioned, the only one that I'd be hesitant on is the alcohol license. Mm -hmm. Only because I think that you know, of the businesses in town that do pretty well, I think restaurants, bars, those kind of things have done pretty well in terms of bringing some vitality. And, and mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't necessarily, I mean, we can talk about it and what the rationale would be, but I wouldn't necessarily want to discourage that or make that more expensive because I think there is follow-on economic benefit to the town Agreed. from the success of those businesses. And again, I'm sure you're not talking about a draconian increase. Right. And I know this has been a, a bigger issue um, in other communities that have artificially restricted the number of license they've, licenses they've had and made it more difficult for businesses to start. But I want to have that discussion mm -hmm. as well. They're not, they're not categorically opposed, but so. Right. Um, we were discussing it more. If we're asking other departments to look at it, we should probably look at our own mm -hmm. fees Fair as enough. well. We did look at the building department last year, and we decided not to raise those fees. Right. Um, my numbers uh, in working with the financial team today on, on our budget projection is um, lower than what Gus is, but you've included a cost of living increase that we have not reflected in this budget projection. Yeah, so right. in my projection, without that, we're at a 1.172 uh, shortfall. Um, without that, without so that. actually, your numbers are higher. I'll, I'll get with you because yeah, we I need to go. I, there were some I couldn't reconcile what you sent me. Okay, uh, we have some changes, so we can we can look at that and see if we can get closer to our, to our numbers matching. But one of the things uh, that does bring up is that you need to have a meeting with the personnel board to discuss um, what the cost of living increase you are recommending to the warrant committee is. Um, we haven't done that yet, um, as well as what that merit amount will be. <laughs> Um, and then scheduling the vote for the capital stabilization as well. So those are the things coming up for your agenda. So if we could just review your March schedule, mm -hmm. we can start. Yeah. It, sa yeah. it sounds like we might want to add a meeting on March 12th. I think we're going to have to. Um, and just to bring up a couple of things, uh, due to the snow last week, the police chief study committee had to postpone their meeting. Um, we were supposed to meet on Tuesday evening when we had the snowstorm. They cannot meet until uh, they did not want to meet this week during vacation week. Half the committee was away. They can't meet until Wednesday the 27th to take their vote on the candidates they're going to send forth to the Board of Selectmen. That only gives you three or four days to review those applications and information before what we had tentatively scheduled on the 5th. So I was proposing um, that you meet on the 12th. Yeah. If I mean, possible. I, I am available. Also uh, on the 12th. So I'm good I, on I would the meet 5th, on the 5th, the 12th, <coughs> and... 5th and 12th. Yeah, fifth to twelve. I had the fifth to twelfth and the nineteenth, unfortunately. Um, and that will give me some flexibility to either do the police chief appointments on the fifth or the twelfth, depending on the outcome of the the committee on uh, did, the twenty seventh. Did, did we ever talk about doing one on the twenty sixth as well? No. We had. I I had had us pencil that in. Now, if we're going to meet on the twelfth as well, we, we don't have to. Well, I was going to say, if we meet on the twelfth rather than meeting on the nineteenth, it'd know. be better to do the twenty sixth, maybe. Although then we're we're again probably just back to back weeks. 26. But I, I don't, they're all good for me yeah. if you have a preference. You, honestly, you may end up with the 5th, the 12th, the 19th, and the 26th. Evelyn's just pointing out to me that the warrant hearing also yeah, needs to be have done. Um, and obviously, they're waiting for information from you. That's got to um, be the 19th, I think. I can't remember if we had the 19th or the 26th. We tentatively it's gotta, scheduled I it. It's got to be, I don't think, the, I think the 26th is too late. I don't, I don't, well, under the, under the charter, what day is town meeting this year? 29. It's the 29th of April. Maybe the 20th. It's got to be, but. I don't remember what's on our sheet. On it's got to be an X number of days before town mm -hmm. meeting. And I, maybe the 26th is too late. Well, let, look. So we're carrying four Tuesday, every Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> there were a few, Bill? Does. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that works. Good? Yeah, All right, good. We'll make it work. That works. Does the 12th work for you, Pete? I, I think I can make it work. I think I scheduled something then, but. Uh, okay. We'll be so in daylight savings things time. Things can change. Same difference. <laughs> so we'll meet in the 5th and the 12th. Look, if we get to the 12th and it turns out by some miracle we don't need to meet at the 19th, then we can meet, not, you know, okay. skip it and meet on the 26th or, or, or cancel the 26th yep. or whatever else we do. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a microphone. Uh, you've seen some of my emails. You know things are picking up on the, on the state hospital. On the, uh, so we're getting, I think, probably close to getting at least half of the work finished up there within the next maybe month, two months. There'll be a couple more PIP meetings probably 
but the uh, laundry parcel in the CVOC plum is going to take a little bit longer. I don't know what you have, if anything, in the budget I do. for. We have, we have money that was appropriated prior for the State Hospital Environmental Review, so we're still carrying uh, okay. approximately 40000 So I think we're... Okay, we're good. good. All right, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Bill. All right, uh, consent agenda. Any comments or questions? My only observation was to commend uh, the high school girls varsity basketball team for getting in early and on the uh, fall car wash schedule. So it's probably they're not the only they're, ones. <laughs> well, but they're here. They're the first ones we've done. So ten or twenty-one. Here. <laughs> so any any concerns on that? No. Nope. Otherwise, we have a motion to approve. I Does? move that we. Uh, yes. No. I move that we approve all items on the consent agenda. Second. All in favor? Yep. All right. All right. Um, town administrator goals. We're going to hold this to the meeting on the 5th. Um, Gus and I are working on some changes uh, to the document, so we'll present the document at the next meeting. Okay. Town Administrator update. Um, I just wanted to let you know I was working with Fred Davis and George Woodbury, who is our streetlight consultant, and these streetlight fixtures have been ordered. Um, they're being delivered the week of March 13th, and we should have installation not long after that. Splendid. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? That's all I have tonight on that. Um, I don't have to do the action list tonight. Selectman report. Uh, Pete. Uh, the uh, Medfield Foundation has uh, uh, named their uh, their volunteers that they're uh, honoring this year. The youth volunteer is going to be Maeve Devlin. The uh, volunteer of the year is Pat Casey. And then there's a Lifetime Achievement Award that's going to Steve and Marie Nolan. All four of those people have just remarkable service to the town. Excellent. Um, Medfield Suicide Prevention uh, Coalition is continuing to, to uh, work on how to spend the 30000 that Denise Garlick got them. And um, there's an issue with the, uh, uh, there's this referral service in town called Interface that uh, you can uh, call up Interface and, and they'll get you a uh, referral to a, uh, a mental health provider. And originally that was, I think, funded by the, the schools and the police kind of teamed up to split the cost of it. Um, and they're not doing it any longer. And so that uh, this current year, uh, the um, Medfield Suicide Prevention Coalition is actually funding it as part of their $30,000 grant from the uh, state. But it runs out in, in uh, November. Um, and uh, so they're looking at how to how to figure out how to get that funded going into the future. They're going to ask the hospitals to, to join together and agree to fund it for a five-year period. So we'll see if that happens. And that's it. You're asking the hospitals to fund it? Hospitals have, a, have an obligation to invest in their communities, just like the banks mm -hmm. do. Under the, I don't know if it's under the Community Reinvestment Act like it is for the banks, but I mean, they have an absolute obligation to spend some money on some community things, and so that uh, the, the hospitals apparently are do look for causes of that sort. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be asking the hospitals. Yes. And if that doesn't work, they're going to ask the banks. <laughs> <laughs> Um, as I already mentioned, the PIP meeting, I haven't been to one in a couple of years, so it was nice to be able to go to one again. And I gather that the, uh, whatever difficulties may have crept in with the state, they didn't appear to me to be there anymore with the new crew that's on there. So uh, without, uh, we'll without shining a candle close to Bill in terms of understanding technically what was being said, uh, my impression of the people from the state side, I was optimistic that they were taking responsibility for some things and maybe we'll they're saying all the right things they're saying all the right things we'll see yeah. what happens okay the next couple of weeks from next month will be yep. critical okay uh i i met with uh, mike pastore about a week and a half ago and briefed him on the same framework that we're using uh more importantly i mentioned that we had talked about having a couple of information sessions before the annual town meeting and you know expressed an interest if he if he wanted either himself or the warrant committee to have a designated person to, I think, Christine, you're on board with this, and yeah. you and me. Uh, but he was very enthusiastic about it. I think that he will uh, join in as well. Um, and I'm happy to do one of those two guys. Yeah. We'll do multiple of them, so right. it doesn't all So far, we've got two planned, but if, yeah. if it's standing room only, then we, we'll schedule more. Um, Can we call it the budget roadshow? <laughs> you can call that if you want. Yeah, the, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or squaring the circle, but uh, yeah. Um, 
And one thing I'll try to, I, I, as I've been thinking about this, I think I should catch up with the superintendent and Michael Francesca to let them see what we've been talking about here so they're aware of what's going on. They may have already seen the electronic I've, Yeah, stuff, I've, I have been sharing it with them. Um, there's useful information there for them to, per, from a perspective standpoint, it's, it's useful information. Um, and we already got the historical commission water bill out of the way. The other house cleaning thing I had, I guess we all got the letter from the Registry of Deeds asking for a Medfield flag. And I, I've been carrying it in my pending folder here. I'm assuming we're willing to send a flag. And they know they, who I think they said they had one already. They got one already. No, I, was, I think they're, they're looking for, for one. one. Doing they construction, they're reconstructing the uh, yeah. registry right. and replacing right. all the flags that are in there now. Right. So he, so you think we've sent him a replacement already? Or? I was talking with the register the other day. I thought he said he had already got one, but I could be mistaken. Okay. Well, we'll be. I don't think we've sent the one. Yeah. No. So well, I was just checking we'll track that just to track. We'll track I, it I just, it's, yeah. it's kind of like, it's not on the action item list, but it's in my pending folder. I was interested because that letter got me thinking about Medfield flags, and I started looking at them. I thought our flags were actually blue, and then I saw these white ones. And, and so. It's always been white. Oh, I saw. I thought for sure I saw. A but blue his one back somewhere. has always been to it. So how would he? Yeah. Do? <laughs> All he did was slap a seal on a flag. <laughs> yeah, but I think I think the one I saw wow. down at the state house. They've got that hall of flags down at the state yeah. house, yeah. and I thought it was blue. They got it hanging from the hanging from the roof in the registry of deeds. Mm. That's what they've replaced. Maybe it was before the king fell at war that it was. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. Uh, so, update from the Affordable Housing Trust. You got the main one tonight with respect to the Mayrock project. Coming out of those meetings, um, I think I will put on a future agenda to talk about sending a letter to our legislators about money for the West Street intersection reconstruction. We're already on the list of dangerous intersections. Uh, I think the fact that we are kind of doing two different affordable housing developments around there should be. Mm -hmm. A little bit of a boost to help us out in terms of making that intersection overall safer uh, in light of the work we're doing there. Now is the time to do it to the, ex to the extent that any of the safety things would involve something with the ingress and egress to the, to the Legion property. Now is the time to do it. So I'll put that on a future well, agenda. Plus two child care centers in proximity. And two child care Excellent point, Mark, as well. We'll put that in the letter also. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on the Rose Bay project, just an update on that. I mean, that's not... You know, that's not moving through the lip process, so they, they've not asked to come mm -hmm. to an affordable housing trust board meeting. They're not required to because of the approach they're taking to it. They've been invited um, and invited to come here as well. They've not yet decided. So uh, unlike the, um, uh, as this and this was stated in the comment letter that we sent in the fall, unlike the lip projects where we have to make an affirmative determination. Uh, we will have to decide, I believe it's in the first 15 days after the ZBA hearing opens, whether we want to ask the ZBA to invoke our safe harbor rights in the note of the project at the outset. We're still in safe harbor, so if in the, in the review of the project the ZBA decides to say no, that decision would stick as a result because they would be seeking relief from the zoning. Uh, they are doing a work on, they've gotten some feedback from some folks. Um, on the planning board and otherwise with respect to the design. So they are doing some work on the design and I don't think they've kind of revised it as yet. And so I think the next action item with respect to them will be after they make whatever changes they're making with, with the design. Although I do anticipate now, uh, unless the developer changes his mind, that he'll proceed with an application for a comprehensive permit and then we'll be making that safe harbor determination at the outset and then the ZBA will have to evaluate the project based on that. That's just that's where things stand, and right and now. we have to invoke that uh, safe harbor at the outset within the first fifteen statute. days, and that kind of ends okay. it. Um, but the ZBA can. Well, they have an appeal from there. If they don't, if they dispute it, they can appeal that to HAC, the right. developer. Yeah. But I don't think there'll be a dispute that we're in safe harbor. Yeah. The uh, the flip side of that is just because you're in safe harbor doesn't preclude you from evaluating. No, we'd have to make it. That, that that that's the decision we'll have to make. So it'll be a different. So it may it may come up in a less orderly fashion than some of the other ones. But the Z, is it is it the selectmen that uh, invoke the safe harbor protection in the first or the instance, yeah. okay, and and so that the ZBA cannot get to the end of the comprehensive permit process, see what they they've been able to negotiate, and then 
decide to invoke well, the safe the harbor. The ZBA, the, ZBA the ZBA asserts it, but it's it's it is. Mike indicates it's it's in the regulations. It has to be done up front. You can't keep it in your back pocket and then lay it on the table at the end when you don't like the way things are going. So they've got our comments. They know what our concerns are. I'm trying to picture by what logic would you not be worried. I would understand why you wouldn't want to present because you're trying to rethink the design, but I, I can't picture what logic you would have that says we're going to ignore your comments and then we're going to come in while you're in safe harbor stat in status and try to jam a design down that you've already told us you don't like. So I, I think we ought to be trying to game this. I would assume that we should be cautiously optimistic that they're trying to move in a direction that we'd find acceptable. We shall see. We shall see. We shall see. Stay tuned. I don't think I don't think you have anything else. Mike, in terms of the affordable housing trust, how much of the million dollars the town uh, allocated to it has it spent? Less than 100. Nice going. So, and some of that will be covered. A lot of that will be covered. Um, I think I mentioned in, in the past, we're in the process of dissolving the Community Development Corporation that had built Allendale and had some money left over. So some of that will be covered by that. Um, and so it may be, at least at this point, um, we'll only have to tap a small amount of that, um, a small amount of that money. If the, the Legion project, the Mayrock pro project goes through, we've kind of shifted our mode a little bit and we're going to be less focused on trying to evaluate these developer-driven projects and more focused on affirmatively identifying projects we want to do and then going out to see if developers are interested. Um, we are we are going to sponsor the article again on, on the Hinkley property, just that piece of it. Um, again, is something that we want to do um, apart from the Safe Harbor piece. And we're still working on uh, still working on the group home. We, we had a little bit of bad luck uh, from the town of Medfield standpoint, which is good luck probably for the greater society, but uh, the, the group we're working with to develop the group home, and they've looked at several locations in, in Medfield, uh, Westwood gave them an acre of land for free. Oh, wow. And so <laughs> um, the, the group home they were looking to site in, in Medfield, they are now going to mm. look to site in um, in Westwood, although they think they, then they have to go through the process to get approval for another one. They think they will, so they're not dropping us, but sort of the, the one that they had lined up, it looks like that one's going to go to Westwood. A piece of land came available, and, and they just, the Westwood gave it to them, and so uh, you couldn't say no to that. We don't, we didn't have an equivalent mm -hmm. piece of land mm -hmm. to offer, so. Um, a question, and I just lost it. You can convert that question into a motion to adjourn. <laughs> I have one other question. Just, just a question for the two of you. Uh, the information uh, item on the tercentenary sign and the proposed <laughs> negotiations. I, first off, I don't know who, did somebody have to agree to that? The state came back and said, well, you can't ruin it. We want to preserve all our historic markers and all their glorious errors, but we can put, we can, you can put another sign, is that? You know, I, I kind of looked at it and said, why don't you just do the fix that we talked about? But I was fascinated that uh, Rob Gregg basically wrote them the letter, and, and the Senator uh, Feeney sent a letter, apparently, of support. And, and because of the way the state bureaucracy works, they responded to Senator Feeney and ignored <laughs> yes. Rob Gregg. And, uh, but but I, I've communicated with Rob Gregg, and he seems to be indicating that he may go along with their suggestion. Yeah. So I think if he was okay with that group was okay with it, I would I, I remember my question. With the Hinkley property, um, the COA reversed its original Yeah, you need so a new vote. You're gonna to have to get that we'll to get it. And the and the driver there is to try to preserve the right to build a garage right in that vicinity and that's what's creating this right. issue. A storage garage. Yeah. Um, just a reminder, the uh, school committee is presenting to the warrant committee on Monday night. Okay. We have a motion to adjourn. I move that we adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank, you. Thank you, everybody. Medfield TV.